session of the May 24th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Council member Kalantari Johnson. Present. Holder. Is currently absent. Coming. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. Present. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Brenner. Present. Thank you. We will now begin our agenda with presentations. Item number six, Beach Safety Week. And I'd like to welcome Fire Chief Rob Odie and Director of Parks and Recreation, Tony Elliott. Hello, Council. Uh, thank you, Mayor Brunner and Council. Um, I'd like to start off uh, this week's presentation with a brief moment of silence um, to remember Hi Fam. He was a 50 year old male who died just over a year ago, May 16th on our main beach um, while with his two children was caught in a rip current. And so um, I just want to observe a moment of silence for him. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Um, I think it's only appropriate to remember Mr. Pham and many of the others that uh, tragically lose their lives on in our coastal waters each year. Um, as many of you may know, this week is National Beach Safety Week. Um, each year to kick off the summer season, the United States Life Saving Association sponsors National Beach Safety Week in an effort to remind all beachgoers to use the mantra, know before you go. Uh, this means that everybody should use extreme caution in the beach and ocean environment and always, always check in with lifeguards before entering the water to become familiar with any um, hazards uh, they may encounter. Um, this year, the fire department in a coordinated effort with a, a number of other coastal agencies developed a PSA, a public safety announcement that we'll be rolling out uh, this summer. Uh, this is in light of, um, in addition to Mr. Pham's tragedy in May of last year, um, in the fall last year, we lost three lives in five days on the North Coast um, due to people being unfamiliar with the cliff environment as well as the ocean um, pocket coves on the North Coast. And so that sort of drummed up a lot of uh, concern on my behalf as well as other county chiefs in the agency and led us um, to develop this, um, this public safety announcement to sort of make a connection with um, both local community as well as the tourists that come and visit our beautiful area. Um, so this PSA emphasizes the message of know before you go and reminds all beachgoers of many of the beach and oceans inherent hazards. Um, and again, they're not limited to rip currents, large swells, uh, ever-changing tides, cold water exposure, and of course, unstable coastal cliff areas. Um, and we were able to, even though we finished wrapping um, production, video production uh, a week and a half ago, I was able to get a teaser or a trailer um, developed and delivered to me early this morning. And so I'd like to share that with the council um, if we can. Bonnie, do you have that ready? Hear we can't anything. hear it. So. Yeah, we're not hearing anything. Well, if we can't, if we can't get it queued up now, I can definitely share it with everybody. There we go. <laughs> we're a national marine a surfing reserve, and as such, it's a destination. So people from all levels want to come and enjoy and experience surfing in Santa Cruz. They, they see the waves and maybe there's a small set and they think they can handle it. And when they actually paddle out there, a larger set will come uh, and they'll wind up in trouble. Go with the buddy, you know, if you're out in the 
water with a person, you guys can keep an eye on each other. You know, anything can happen. Even if you are a really competent swimmer, even if you do feel like you could be really safe, it's better to have that extra layer of security. You're going to go swimming uh, around our beaches and most beaches. It's good to stay in the swim zone and stay close to the shore. Yeah, uh, you would not want to just jump in that water and, and go swimming unless you're really prepared and you're used to cold water and the effects that it has on your body. So if you're going to come to the beach here in Santa Cruz, um, I would definitely encourage you to bring your sunscreen, bring your water, and make sure to bring your common sense with you. It's the preventable situations, uh, those situations that where we can intervene by way of outreach and education. But we're here because we love the water, we love the beach, we love the ocean. But a big part of my job, and everyone down here, is talking to the public. That's what we're here for. We love to provide as much education to the public as we can. Our job is to help people in the water, but if we can help them on land before they get in the water and then, you know, limit people from getting in trouble, then that's like a really good day for us. Awesome. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, so again, uh, this that's just a little preview of what we have to come. We'll have a couple of different spots, 15 to 30 second spots that we'll be, we'll be doing a heavy push with the business community as well as the um, visitors bureau to have those um, in hotels and, and other areas that we can make connections with. Again, the local community as well as visitors to our area. So again, uh, this is National Beach Safety Week, which begins, uh, we began yesterday and extends through Memorial Days. Again, as a reminder of everybody to, to be safe when visiting the beach area. And so now I'd like to turn it over to DC from Parks and Rec uh, to complete our presentation. Hello, I'm DC Lawson Thomas, Recreation Supervisor of our beach programs, notably the Junior Guard program. And I just wanna go over some numbers from last year that was um, provided from the fire department. Uh, we had approximately 650,000 visitors on Santa Cruz beaches. This was an increase of 150,000 since the middle of the pandemic last year. With this increase in mind, we're gearing up for another busy summer this year. Um, because we are staffing Capitola Beach, we had 206,000 visitors at Capitola Beach last year. So it gave a department total of 860,000 people, which is a ton. <laughs> um, Santa Cruz lifeguards had 96 aquatic rescues on Maine and 141 on Capitola a total of 237 rescues. Across both beaches, we had 30 boat rescues and 142 preventative actions. Like what Rob said, a lot of what they do is preventative. And these numbers are why the Parks and Rec Department and Fire Departments are collaborating to spread this word of beach safety. On social media, we will be presenting all of USLA's top 10 beach tips, and we hope that um, we encourage everyone to share these tips and these tips can also be found in the city manager's weekly update from last week. In tandem with the no before you go PSA, I want to challenge city council. I want you guys to spread some of these beach safety tips. If you have friends and relatives visiting Santa Cruz and you visit the beach, point out a rip current, show them where the lifeguard towers are, introduce your friends and family to the lifeguard on duty. So for our programs, a gym booth has returned to Harvey West Park and is offering swim lessons through November. And the junior guards is back in full programming. We're doing four week sessions, two sessions. Our competitions are coming back. We'll be over at Capitola Beach for Capitola competition. Our own NorCal competition is coming back. And regionals is down in Huntington State Beach at, near the end of July. Um, unrelated to the junior guard programs, it's, I'm also happy to announce that nationals will actually be in California in August. Um, but that'll be after the program ends. And yeah. Thank you, DC. And again, thank you, Mayor Brenner and Council for this opportunity just to spread the word of beach safety. And I really want to point out that when you guys have the opportunity, um, please bring uh, your family and friends down to Lifeguard Headquarters or to a Lifeguard Tower and allow us to introduce ourselves and provide them those preventative, that information that's necessary to stay safe in our local community. And with that, that concludes our presentation. Thank you so much, Chief Odie and Daniel Lawson Thomas. Thank you for joining us today and sharing that incredibly vital information. Stay safe out there. Okay, um, our next presentation is uh, on the agenda is um, 
a mayoral proclamation declaring June 2022 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month. And um, this proclamation I have moved to present in person at the Pride Festival, though there will be on Sunday, June 5th um, in Santa Cruz uh, at Abbott Square, there will be a program and um, I have been asked to present it in person. Uh, 12 to four, I believe noon it will start. There is an 11 a.m. parade, but there is all the information about Pride Weekend next weekend, as well as the festival on Sunday, June 5th, and that's at santacruzpride.org. And um, myself, and I know um, we are very happy to support uh, the festivities and the effort. So um, please join me if, if you can on Sunday, June 5th for the mayoral proclamation declaring um, the month of June 2022 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month in the city of Santa Cruz. And as a reminder from um, 2020, I believe, uh, City, uh, the pride flag will be hung uh, for the month of June at City Hall. All right, so now I will move on into the agenda. I have a few announcements and we'll then continue with the regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25, as well as streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an item today, call in at the beginning of the item and using the instructions on your screen. You can mute your television or streaming device when you call in and listen through the phone. Please note that there is a delay in streaming. So if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's your turn for public comment, please raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature in your webinar controls on your computer. Please note public comment is only heard on count items that council is taking action on and not on the regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are items number 10 through 23 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Any council members? I have um, I have a statement of disqualification for items number thirteen and fourteen, um, and that is the annual work plans that are related to my employment. So I will not be participating in the vote of consent items number thirteen and fourteen. And um, I will ask the city clerk to announce any additions and deletions. There are none. Okay. At this point, I'd like to call on the city attorney, Tony Condotti, to provide a report on our closed session this morning. Good afternoon. Mayor Bruner, members of the City Council. Uh, this morning at 10.30, the Council met in closed session via Zoom uh, to discuss the items that are listed on your posted agenda, <clears throat> including uh, item one, the Council referred uh, the real property at 136 River Street to closed session for uh, Council consideration of real property negotiations. Item two was a conference with labor negotiators. Council met from and received a report from its uh, 
It's labor negotiator with respect to all bargaining groups, including SEIU temporary employees, SEIU service employees, bid managers, OE3, supervisors, OE3, fire management, fire, IAFF, police management, police officers association and executives. <clears throat> item three was an item of significant exposure to litigation. Uh, with regard to that item, the council by a 6-0 vote with council member Watkins absent approved the settlement of a claim by former city employee Susan O'Hara in the sum of $250,000. A copy of the settlement agreement uh, can be obtained upon request by members of the public once it has been fully uh, executed and, and finalized. <clears throat> Item four, there were two items of real property negotiations. One, the real property at 115 C Coral Street owned by the city. Uh, the city met with its negotiator, Bonnie Lipscomb, on that item, as well as item two, the real property at 136 River Street, the former site of the uh, outdoor world on River Street there. Uh, council met and received a report from its uh, negotiator. There was no reportable action on that item. Uh, item five was a conference with legal counsel involving ex existing litigation. That was the item City of Santa Cruz et al. versus Pacific Gas and Electric Company currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Uh, there was no reportable action on that item. And that concludes my report. I will now call on the city clerk to provide any updates to our calendar. There are no updates. Thank you. Now is the time for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authority meetings for future meetings, please come prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred since the last council meeting update so that the council and the public can be informed. All right, I will go out to our council members and I will begin with council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, to report out, um, I'll start with LAFCO. So LAFCO, um, on our agenda, we had a sphere review item of the city of Capitol and the incorporated, uh, and the sphere that incorporates that area. And one of the things that actually came out of that um, was that the uh, Within the sphere, there's a lot of properties that aren't, that have not been annexed into the city of Capitola. And um, there was some interest in determining what Capitola's future plans are around annexation since the space is, there's a lot of space within the sphere. And the reason why there's um, that space within the sphere is that over time, the city will expand and annex into that space. Um, so um, the there'll be some follow-up with LAFCO staff and Capitola city staff to determine um, what kind of plans uh, will be put in place for future growth. And that was also the last meeting um, where the city of Santa Cruz will have a representative on that board for I believe the next two two years, I believe. And so that uh, actually concludes my term, a four-year term on LAFCO, and we can actually now remove that from um, our external community uh, organization since we will no longer have a representative on that board. Um, <clears throat> next, I'll, I'm going to talk just briefly about um, Downtown Management Corp, but I think the mayor, since she's on the Downtown Association, could probably speak to that in a little bit more detail than I can, but we, um, oh, you're not a representative. Oh, gotcha. Okay. No, I, I report to that board. Got it. Okay. I don't sit on that board. Okay. Got it. So then um, a large part of that meeting, we got an update on um from the downtown association related to um the types of calls who we're seeing as calls for service related to mental and behavioral health we also got an update on um tourism and people who are visiting the downtown uh the downtown management corp also 
took a position on the Our Downtown, Our Future ballot measure that's going to be coming forward. Um, the, the Downtown Management Court uh, endorsed a no vote on that item. And, um, and also, Vice Mayor Myers is on that board too, so she can also help fill in if there's anything missing. Um, Criminal Justice Council, we received an update on efforts that are underway to explore the amount of calls received by law enforcement related to um, mental and behavioral health. Um, that work is still underway, but one of the things we did receive that's a piece of good news and came out of a lot of work that our community did around public safety in 2020 was that um, last year, as you all may know, the Criminal Justice Council had conducted a review of policies related to use of force, transparency, accountability, and technology um, across all the agencies within the county. And that report was um, concluded in November of last year. Uh, Chairman Zach Friend submitted that report to the National Association of Counties. And um, at our meeting, I believe it was either last Tuesday or the Tuesday before, the last Tuesday, um, he informed us that the Santa Cruz County Criminal Justice Council uh, received a 2022 Achievement Award from the National Association of Counties in recognition of their regional effort to examine cross-jurisdictional police practices throughout the county. And so that's a really good piece of news that reflects a lot of the work that was started when I was mayor and that was um, led by our African-American community, which then um, went to the Criminal Justice Council and um, really showed uh, you know, how many policies we have in common throughout the county and the consistency in these policies around use of force transparency um, and, and uh, accountability. And uh, this report also came to the Public Safety Committee, and I think the recommendation that came out of the CJC was that it come to the full council so that if there's any policies we want to adopt, we can consider it. And so given the significance of this award, I hope that we can see um, that report come to the full council for consideration. Um, and I believe that is... Oh, and the one other update is that the, um, the Beach Flats Parking Subcommittee did meet with staff and um, a piece of good news is that it seems like we're going to be able to get um, 10 additional parking spaces in the Beach Flats area. Parking is a major concern for Beach Flats residents. And so um, we're glad to see that we'll be able to have some more opportunities for permit holders within that area. And there's, um, in addition to that, the um, lottery program for parking permits at Nueva Vista is underway. Um, and that effort was led by the mayor as, as part of this group as well. Um, and there's further exploration around parking fee, parking permit fees to determine whether or not we'll be able to make parking permits within that area more affordable for residents, in particular those that are at Nueva Vista. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for serving on LAFCO as our Santa Cruz representative. Okay, um, I will now go to um, uh, Council Member Myers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my report has been given. I uh, only attended the Downtown Management Corporation um, meeting, and so my report was covered by Council Member Cummings. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'll start with the Area Agency on Aging. I have a couple of items of that may be of interest to the general public as well as my council colleagues. The first is that the California Senior Legislature um, and our, our region has an opening for uh, an assembly member of the California Senior Legislature. It's a program that has been in operation for um, decades now and involves senior uh, members of, of various of different communities in, in the various assembly and senate districts uh, serving in and actually bringing and introducing pieces of legislation um, concerning seniors and um, then working with specific legislators to try to get those moving through the state legislative process. And uh, we have an opening now for an assembly representative. So a senior citizen who is interested in serving in the California senior legislature, 
Um, we are accepting applications now. You can go to the Area Agency of um, Aging Santa Cruz and San Benito County's website to um, get the information or contact me and I'll uh, connect you. Um, so this is, and so we've had a really great representative for a long, long time, Chuck Molnar. He is retiring from his uh, position as a retiree and, uh, you know, re has represented us really well. And he, um, uh, we are hoping, he is hoping and we are all hoping that we can get somebody to fill those um, capable shoes. The Senate seat has been filled by Mickey Luna, who is a San Benito County uh, resident and longtime advocate around senior issues. She was served on the AAA and has just been really involved. So we're, we're well represented there, um, but we wanted to try to get another person on board. The, uh, the agency itself, uh, which has a, a mix of elected officials and community representatives on the board, is looking for, we have two openings right now for uh, people with disabilities who would like to represent uh, the senior and disabled community on the AAA. And so those are also positions you can find out more about at the AAA website or by um, contacting me. Um, another report that we received at our last meeting on the 18th uh, was not such great news. We, the Live Oak School District has now, um, and we, this has been an ongoing conversation and I've, I've mentioned it in the past, but they have now uh, officially um, uh, served an eviction notice to the senior programs that operate at, through, at the Live Oak Senior Center, which is owned by the Live Oak School District. So, um, and that those programs include Meals on Wheels, which um, utilizes a commercial kitchen there. And so the, it's, it's kind of a, a desperate situation now to try to identify an alternative location in particular for that function. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> if anybody out there is, who is listening has thoughts on this, a lot of uh, op opportunities have been explored, um, but nothing has been identified as uh, and, you know, suitable location that is uh, accessible right at this moment. So we are um, beginning to have uh, more in-depth conversations in the city of Santa Cruz. The staff will be involved in those conversations as well. But I wanted to just um, let people know this is a, a pretty significant challenge. This is where all of the meals that are distributed to um, in-home and to the congregant, congregant meal sites um, are prepared. So a um, lot of work, um, need for an appropriate space, and please um, contact us if you have any ideas. Uh, the Regional Transportation Commission met, and um, we uh, had, a, had a long meeting, <laughs> but hopefully this will be a short report. Um, we, uh, we've been working to try to get a uh, uh, project started to rehabilitate the Pajaro River Bridge um, along the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line and um, had to unfortunately reject a construction bid um, for it just coming in at a uh, unreasonable cost. But we are working, the commission was clear that we wanted the staff to continue to work uh, with uh, various stakeholders to try to identify ways to do some of that work so that we can keep that bridge um, in uh, um, safe uh, and 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 you know operational um, status, we also adopted um, an agreement with the San Lorenzo Valley Schools Complex to do a study around circulation and access at that site. It's um, been identified as a significant hazard for um, people coming in and on and off the. Um, SLV schools complex site. So um, the RTC and, um, you know, really with the leadership of Supervisor McPherson has been working to try to identify ways to make that um, site more safer and, and more accessible. Um, so that's happening. Um, we also adopted an unmet paratransit and transit needs list, um, which unfortunately showed that we, while we have made significant progress in large part to the funding made available through Measure D 
and um, other sources, um, we have been able to meet some of the in, the additional needs that have had not been met in our community for quite some time, but we still have a long way to go. Um, so um, that is, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of work to do there. Um, but it's an interesting list and worth looking at for folks who are interested in transit um, and alternative transit um, options. And you know, just to get a sense of what we are funding and and what uh, what needs to be done in the future, uh, we also uh, adopted a, a program for highway corridors and active transportation. We um, a five year program for projects, um, which will uh, allow us to move forward with um, applying for competitive funding for um, for rail trail segments and also for the highway um, work that needs to be done. And the Air Board, the Monterey Bay Air Resources District Board meeting um, was pretty pro forma, um, budget considerations and other uh, matters. But one item I wanted to highlight um, is that, the, so MBARD has uh, various programs that uh, local agencies, local jurisdictions can apply to for assistance for um, emission reductions, technologies, and equipment, and one of which we'll be hearing about on our um, agenda for a little bit later. Um, but uh, we're, there's an additional pot of funding this year that is being dedicated to lawn equipment, um, so landscaping equipment uh, replacement for um, reduced emissions and zero emission technologies. Uh, so um, also interesting for, for folks to look out for that. Um, and I think, and I filled in for uh, Council Member Cummings on AMBAG, but I don't think there was anything significant to note there. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have some, a number of updates. Uh, I serve on the Youth Action Network as an elected official representative. And we've been working on um, taking the children and youth bill of rights to, throughout our county. And in fact, today, the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors um, considered adopting the children and youth bill of rights, which was formed after what we did here at the city. Um, I assume that that went through, but I, I'm not sure I haven't gotten an update. Um, also working with Youth Action Network to implement our youth liaison. A uh, piece that we passed with the Children and Youth Bill of Rights. So hopefully by fall, we will have a dedicated youth liaison that will work with Youth Action Network and, and work directly with um, myself or other council members who are interested. So that's Yan. Um, the Metro Board met last week. I was not able to attend, but I did attend the Finance Committee, and uh, the Finance Committee approved a draft budget for FY23 and FY24. That was presented to the board last week and a final budget will be presented to the board at the end of June on June 24th. And, and that's about a $70 million budget for the Metro. Um, let's see. I also serve on the Community Action Board. And this last month, the month of May was Community Action Month. We heard from uh, CAB employee Helen Ewan's story at our last meeting, but I just want to reiterate and highlight some of the important work that our local CAB has done. They are part of a national network. Uh, this last year in 2021, our CAB served 10,643 people, 85% of whom are Latinx and 80% um, who live below the 250% federal poverty line. And just really in brief, some of the work that they've done uh, includes rental assistance, um, uh, food assistance, uh, job readiness and job placement, uh, working with individuals uh, who are from the, uh, working with indigenous language speakers and providing them with COVID information, uh, serving immigrants and um, helping them on a pathway to residency and um, legal and advocacy services. So that's just some of the work that they've done. And I wanted to highlight that because we, of course, the city does support and provide some survey, um, some funding 
uh, to our local cab. So um, I'm glad that we can contribute to their amazing work and just want to thank all of the members of um, cab employees and cab partners for the work that they do. So that's cab. And then just really briefly, the safe parking program subcommittee did meet with members of Association of Faith Community. We're continuing to work with them to build out the safe parking program. And I think I'll leave the health and all policies subcommittee to um, Vice Mayor Watkins to report out on. That's it. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I let's see, is Council Member Golder here? Absent. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, thank you, and thank you to my colleagues for all the work you're doing on behalf of the council. I think what I could add is the health and all policies um, subcommittee that met just yesterday, actually, <clears throat> excuse me, just really incredible and proud to see the work that's been happening um, within the city and um, just the progress we've made with the implementation plan. A lot of work around translation policy so that we can ensure equity and we're able to communicate um, and have plans and practices in place to um, understand when translation is needed, appropriate, and best suited to um, meet the needs of our community. Uh, just learned about an online resource that sounds wonderful um, to help with some of the translation services. So more will be coming to the full council on that. Um, a lot of discussion also around equity within the departments and training that had occurred um, within the city, I think just last week and more trainings will be happening for city employees around equity. And then um, additional conversation had about commissions and how we can be aware of the demographics of our commissioners, but also be mindful about wanting to really pursue more diversity within our commission appointments and identifying policy. And just one sort of interesting note was that when a number of folks who are working with the city and with this committee and a number of interns did some research so they found a lot of statements of interest around commission diversity but not a lot of policy and so as we move forward with designing what would work for the city of santa cruz in this way i think we will really lead other cities in wanting to pursue something hopefully very similar um grants are always a key thing that we're thinking about and um and ways to financially resource the work. So that was also discussed, but more to come on that. Um, I was a little bit late to the two by two meeting, but that did um, occur also. We had an opportunity to um, kind of just discuss with the county, a lot of our strategies, um, the coordinated care, some of the different programming, the funding, um, how can we get creative with funding? Uh, for example, the Homeward Bound program was, was referenced in creativity in terms of funding but also just the transitioning of funding associated with some of the um, some of the facilities that we have up and running for our unhoused population. And I think that covers my committees for this report out. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Um, well, that leaves me and uh, let's see, one of the boards that I sit on with Vice Mayor Watkins is visit Santa Cruz County and that meeting will be tomorrow which we unfortunately will be missing due to our budget hearings so nothing to report on that um, the health and all policies uh, committee meeting uh, Vice Mayor uh, Watkins spoke to um, really the summary of uh, two items on uh, working on interpretation and translation and how the city is addressing those needs across uh, many aspects in the city and for our, our community, um, whether it be council meetings, commissions, complex documents, council members being able to access information. Um, so all of that's being explored. And um, the second item of uh, commissions and uh, committees, advisory bodies, and um, how we're uh, recruiting and applications and outreaching for diversity um, in those uh, bodies as well. 
and then I think you covered everything on the two by two as well. There was um, great discussion um, on really working together for the 14 million uh, uh, state funding, um, really having county and city work together um, to really work on mutual agreements, transparency, collective direction, um, and really keeping, trying to keep flexibility in the funds, knowing that so many of the programs and investments in the, in the shelter opportunities, um, some short-term, some long-term, some with different needs. So having um, the funding remain flexible was key. Um, and then we also had a um, city selection committee meeting and we touched on, um, we had a public health briefing from our county health department who spoke about um, kind of the numbers and the data and the most recent data um, and uh, really mentioning underreporting due to home testing, the large amount of home testing that's now occurring versus um, maybe last year there was more um, site testing where those results were more known. Um, so going with the data that is now current. Um, also, we had a discussion regarding ADUs and um, whether they would be considered in affordable housing towards our regional housing needs assessment goals. And countywide, we spoke of our upcoming uh, regional housing needs assessment goals um, for all of the cities. Uh, the city selection committee, I should say, is a representative of mayors from the city of Capitola, Scotts Valley, Santa Cruz, and Watsonville. So we spoke of the uh, new numbers for the, the required housing uh, goals in the next cycle. And also touched on outdoor uh, dining and uh, parklet areas across the county and had a really good discussion around uh, shared policies, um, noting that some members in the community um, are finding it confusing with different policies in place in the different cities. And uh, uh, some of those, uh, some of the, the input has come from maybe business owners that own businesses in two different cities with different policies around outdoor dining and um, outdoor parklets. So we had some good discussion around um, um, around that. And that concludes my report. Thank you, everybody. I will now go back to my um, agenda. We first up now have the consent agenda. These items are 10 through 17 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you wish to comment on any of the items 10 through 17 on our consent agenda, now is the time to call in. Instructions should be on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device and raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. And I do want to reiterate, I will not be voting on items, agenda items 13 and 14. 
Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items? Okay, council member Kalantari Johnson. I'd like to comment on 12. I tried to put shots There we go. Okay, comment on 12. And uh, council member Brown. I have a quick comment on 16. Comment on 16. Council member Cummings. I'm gonna pull 13. Um, I have a question on 15 and a comment on 16. Cummings, pull 13. Comment on. Comment on 16 and question on 15. Question on 15. Okay. Okay. So I will begin with comments and I will start with agenda item number 12. And that is Cal Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. I just um, want to bring this to attention for everyone. This is the um, request for our mayor to send a letter to the governor around Roe versus Wade. So I want to thank you, Mayor Bruner and Vice Mayor Watkins for putting this on the consent agenda. I just I think this is um, an important time for us to speak up about reproductive rights and women's rights and LGBTQ rights. And um, I'm tracking this closely and see that that Republican dominated states are um, really forging ahead. So it's an important time for us to speak up and support our governor in making us a sanctuary state um, and making this safe for everyone who wishes to choose um, to have their reproductive rights maintained. So thank you to my colleagues. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Um, and now we have comments on agenda item number 16. Council Member Brown. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to highlight this item and thank our staff. The item for members of the public um, is uh, essentially, uh, it's a series of, of actions to uh, fully fund and purchase three heavy and medium duty electric vehicles. Um, so I just, this is something that I've been uh, advocating for and and really you know wanting us to uh, move forward on for um, during my time on the council and um, so I just wanted to thank our public works uh, staff and Tiffany Wise West in particular for uh, doing the work to receive this uh, competitive grant funding some of it coming through uh, the Community Power Board, um, Central Coast Energy, and some of it through the Monterey Bay Re Resources District, a, a different pot of funding than the one I mentioned earlier. Um, but there is funding available um, out there and, and we are uh, going for it. And so I just, I, I'm, I'm really thrilled to see this happening and um, just wanted to thank everyone for their work to make it, um, to move it forward. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Cummings? We had a comment on agenda item 16 as well. You know, I just want to thank the staff for all their work on this. Um, this was when I first got on council in 2019. This was something that uh, many community members expressed interest in um, um, because, you know, in our effort to reduce our carbon emissions, um, being able to convert our fleet over to electric vehicles is something that people expressed a lot of interest in. And it's, you know, just one more step in the direction of doing our part to reduce our carbon emissions and um, do our part to mitigate the impacts of climate change. And so just wanted to express my appreciation to the staff that they're actively pursuing, you know, all efforts to uh, make our, our fleet 100% um, electric. So just want to thank you all for in public works for all your hard work on this. Thank you, council member Cummings. Um, Vice Mayor Watkins. You, I see your hand up. Yeah, my hand was up, Mayor. I'm wondering if for the ease of sort of how this could flow for your um, purposes of disqualification is if it would be 
most appropriate for me to pull 14 and we could have 13 and 14 heard separately um, and then hear the rest of the consent agenda while you're able to participate. So I'll go ahead and pull 14 for those purposes okay. now. Great, thank you. So we um, have items 13 and 14 pulled. Okay, so moving on with the question uh, on item number 15, Council Member Cummings, you had a question on item number 15. Yeah, so for um, members of the public, this is Police Department Roof Restoration Award Contract. Um, and one of the things that kind of similar to um, item number 16, the city has been make, trying to make a lot of efforts towards going green and reducing carbon emissions. And given that we're going to do um, you know, some substantial repairs on the roof of the police department, one of the questions that came to me from the city, from the community is, um, is there any effort to move forward with putting solar on the roof of the police station? And they ask this because given the fact that there's going to be work done on the roof, it would seem like, um, you know, putting solar panels in at the same time might be, you know, a win-win. Is there someone from um, staff that could respond to that question? Uh, <clears throat> I see Director Mark Dettel with Public Works. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that's a really good question, um, Council Member Cummings. Um, at this point, I we do have solar panels over the parking lot, and we really focused on energy management. We had a grant to actually reduce the energy used at the police department, and that's a, a more cost-effective way at this point. But now that we do have a, a new roof on it, that could be another uh, next step that we could look at as we continue to move forward. But uh, obviously you want to do the roof before you do the solar panels so you don't have to take them off and redo a roof. So that's a really good question and we can look, look at that in the future. Great. That's, that was my only question on that item. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me go back to um, my agenda here. So. We have a time now for public comment on agenda items 10 through 17, with the exception of 13 and 14. Those have been pulled. We'll come back to those. So for now, if you are a member of the public that would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda, now is the time to do so please raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. When it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will then be set to three minutes. And I will go to the attendees list. And I see the first hand raised ends phone number ending in 1999. Go ahead and unmute. Welcome. Yes, hello. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Um, can I be heard clearly? Yes. Hello. Excellent. Hello. So I would first like to thank the, the clerk that. that answer the question that you can make comments about the consent agenda. I would like to make comments first on number 16 and then number 10. Number 16 is an allocation of about $2.1 million for five fully electric vehicles. I'd like to remind the public and the council that um, diesel electric locomotives are extremely efficient and can be extremely clean. Um, that design was 1896 and there's really nothing better that's that's more efficient than that. Um, so going to number 10, the resolution authorizing the city council to only have teleconference meetings, my understanding, and I could be wrong, that you guys had two different opportunities for the public to speak in person. I think I spoke two weeks ago five times. Um,
got disconnected. Oh no. Okay. Um, if, uh, let's see, he said his name was James. If James calls back, I can let him finish his second half. Um, so I will go to the next hand raised. I am watching you is the name. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I, one of those bullet points on item 12 says, uh, advises to uh, develop mechanisms to make sure any woman fleeing other states and coming to California for an abortion uh, should uh, get the treatment they need without regard to uh, their ability to pay. And the state working, you know, blah, 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 should ensure the necessary funds are available to cover these services. This seems fiscally irresponsible and is going to make California, if that happened, uh, you know, Californians paying for the abortions all over the country. I think that's, well, I think that's dumb, okay? Um, as far as uh, the rest of uh, it goes, uh, my letter really that I sent uh, pretty much says, you know, the, the, you, you don't really acknowledge that there's a wide uh, variety of opinion about uh, how late a late-term abortion is, and it's gonna vary between states and between individuals. 80% of the public doesn't believe in uh, third-term abortions, and you don't uh, you don't uh, chime in on that at all. Uh, I assume from reading your letter that you, there are no limit, and so I think that's uh, uh, not where the public's coming from. And uh, uh, there, uh, you know, the Supreme Court has overturned previous opinions many, many times, uh, and it's always been to the good. And I, I mentioned in my letter, consider where we'd be if the separate but equal doctrine wasn't overturned. You know, they they overturned uh, after further consideration that some of the decisions haven't been right. And if you read the opinion, which I doubt you did, it's 98 pages, it's very convincing that the federal government does not have the authority to establish any such federal right to an abortion and it specifically states that it doesn't apply to LGBTQ rights or any other rights. So I have to say thanks. Thank you for your public comment. Um, I see phone number ending in 1999 has returned. So go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, welcome back. You know what? I appreciate it. I don't know what happened to the thing. So going back to agenda item number 16, a couple years ago, Germany had a hydrogen powered vehicle that was 750 horsepower, a range of 600 miles and used 30 gallons of regular seawater. I don't know what's more sustainable than that. So going back to item number 16, um, uh, you know, I'm just going to remind whoever's listening and the council that Drew Glover in 2019 brought up that uh, under the First Amendment, people can say whatever language they want. I'm going to try to keep it clean, but you know, I'm just going to do my best. So I'm, uh, I find it really sad and disconcerting that the public can't show up and speak. I don't know what kind of government is actually being practiced. Um, my understanding is that there's government was created for these two primary reasons. And that is to love thy neighbor and do no harm. So thank you very much. All right. It looks like that concludes our attendees for public comment on consent agenda. Um, and I just did want to respond to item agenda item number 10 is um, the uh, reoccurring off 30 day authorization for the uh, uh, I don't have the exact wording in front of me, but it allows us to hold virtual meetings. Um, and that continues even as we do hybrid meetings. We did have the several last meetings were in person and online. So that's considered a hybrid model. And as long as we do that, whether completely virtual or virtual and in person, we do need that authorization. Um, unfortunately, we were unable to hold in person today and tomorrow. 
um, due to the uptick in COVID cases. And um, so we hope to return to in-person um, as soon as possible and um, continue with the in-person and online hybrid model. So stay tuned. Thank you for being with us virtually today. Let's see, I am now bringing it back to council and um, I'm looking for a remote, a motion on the items with the exception of items 13 and 14. Council member, Vice Mayor Watkins. Sure, Mayor, I'm happy to move the consent agenda with the exceptions of 13 and 14. I'll second it, Myers. Okay. And, and a second. Councilmember Myers. Councilmember Brown, was was that why your hand was up? Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so may we, is there any other further discussion? May we have a roll call vote? Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Boulder. Aye. Coming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brunner? Aye. Those items passed unanimously. Okay, um, at this point, I will hand it over to Vice Mayor Watkins for the remaining consent agenda items 13 and 14. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, so items 13 and 14, I pulled 14 um, uh, just for the purposes of having the mayor not participate in that item. So we'll hear the two, and I know um, Councilmember Cummings, you pulled item 13. So we'll go ahead and have you speak to that. Yeah, I, <clears throat> thank you, Vice Mayor. I pulled item number 13. This is Downtown Association Parking and Business Improvement Area Assessment for fiscal year 2023. Um, I, the only reason why I pulled this is because um, it looks like there's two options within the motion. It's approve or to modify and approve. And so if that was to, if we were to take a vote on that language in particular, um, it would be a little bit confusing, I think. And so I just, you know, was wanting to pull this to make sure that we clarified um, whether or not there's a desire for us to provide input uh, to modify the uh, plan or um, if you're asking for um, just clear approval. Rebecca, I see you on here. I'm happy to hand it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, Vice Mayor and Council members, I'm Rebecca Unit, Economic Development Manager for the City of Santa Cruz. Um, and so um, I can just give a brief overview of this item and make the clarification in the recommendation for you. Um, but as you're aware, this is our uh, annual renewal process for the uh, business improvement assessment. Um, and so this assessment is collected on behalf of the downtown association uh, for the business owner in the downtown district. And the city is uh, just the fiscal agent passing through that assessment to the businesses. So in our recommendation, we do have approve or to modify and approve the plan. Um, this is the work plan that the downtown association board brings together and approves. Typically the city council doesn't weigh in on that. Um, it is typically just an approval process. Um, so we would welcome that in uh, the motion. Um, and then the second piece of this recommendation is to adopt the resolution of intention to levy the assessment. And so um, it will come back at the June 14th meeting as a public hearing item. Um, and any protests on the assessment can be heard at that time. And we'll give notice to all the, um, the downtown association gives mem notice to their membership for the renewal. Um, I can provide more detail, but just want to give that initial clarification. Thanks. So if I could follow up. Um, so I guess, you know, the action we could take is just then to approve the plan prepared by the downtown association. This yeah. year comes okay, great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Myers. 
Uh, I would be uh, I would be happy to make that motion if there's no other questions or comments. And after after public comment is taken on this item. Great. Okay. Move Thank to you. approve. Move to approve. Okay. Great. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you. Are there any comments um, from council members? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and um, move to the attendees. And now we're hearing items 13 and 14 on our consent agenda. And uh, we have our first attendee, Anita, and I will stick to the mayor's three minutes and go ahead and um, allow Anita to speak. Hi, I had intended to speak to number 18, actually, so... Can I hold for that? Yes, you can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other members of the community who would like to address the council on our consent agenda items 13 or 14? If you are interested in doing that, please raise your hand now. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back to the council for action. I believe Councilmember Myers was interested in moving 13 and 14 with the modified language to reflect approve um, in item 13. If that's correct, we'll go ahead and hear uh, Councilmember Myers' motion. I'll second. Okay. All right, any further discussion? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and take a roll call vote. Thank you for both items 13 and 14. Council members Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Holder. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Myers. Councilmember Myers. Aye. And Vice Mayor Watkins. Aye. So that passes unanimously with uh, Mayor Bruner recusing herself. Okay, I'll bring it back to the mayor. Oh, we have the second item, Councilmember Watkins. Oh, I apologize. Is that item 14? No. Uh, yes. So, the, um, cooperative can we just confirm really, really quick? We, we just did a vote on both items? Yes, we did. There was only one yeah. reason the item 13 was pulled. Um, it was for clarification that council member Cummings had. I pulled 14 for um, ease of the kind of facilitating the process. So that was voted upon in the last um, vote, if, unless council members have any further questions. Okay, seeing then, great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rebecca. Great, okay. Well, that concludes our consent agenda and I will hand it back to the mayor now that she is able to come back. Hello, thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Um, okay, next up on our agenda is item number 18. This is a public hearing for second reading and adoption of ordinance number 2022-06, an ordinance transitioning to district-based elections and selecting a seven district map option and a six district map op option along with related election sequencing. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be questions from council followed by public comment and then we will then return to council for comments, deliberation, and action. In addition to the public comment, we will be hearing on this item, three emails were sent to city council at city of Santa Cruz 
www.ecofactorycc.com regarding this item. Okay, so now I will um, see if there are any questions from council on this item. And I see council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I had a I was contacted by a member of the public um, earlier today, and they shared an article. And in that article um, was a quote related to the Fair Maps Act and potential violation of the Fair Maps Act. And so I just wanted to get some clarification on this. So the quoted in the article was that in 2020, the California legislature amended the Fair Maps Act to adjust the deadline when the final district map must be adopted. Agencies with elections held between January 1st and July 1st, 2022 must complete the redistricting process and adopt the final map no later than 174 days before the election. For agencies with June 7, 2022 elections consolidated with the statewide primary election, the final deadline was December 15, 2021. Agencies with the November 8, 2022 election consolidated with the statewide general election must adopt their maps no later than 205 days before the election or April 17, 2022. The act permits charter cities to establish different deadlines. However, they may face practical deadlines to finalize maps and submit them to their county in time for a particular election. And so given that information, um, I forwarded this over when I received it to the city attorney and was wondering if you could comment or if there was any concern related to violation of the Fair Maps Act, which would then put us in a legal situation should we move forward today. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, and, and thank you for uh, giving us a heads up uh, about this article, which which does quote the Fair Maps Act. And, um, you know, after my uh, heart stopped palpitating, we were able to take a look at this statute. And uh, the Fair Maps Act is, uh, and, the, and the language that you quoted from is from Elections Code Section 21662, uh, I believe. And... Uh, and that applies for uh, redistricting uh, that occurs um, during that window of, period of time that the legislature enacted this special statute. Uh, but it expressly does not apply to a charter city that has adopted a different redistricting deadline by ordinance. Uh, and more importantly, it expressly does not apply when a city transitions from at large to district based elections. So, so the Fair Maps Act is really looking at redistricting and not um, establishment of district elections in the first instance. So we're comfortable that the deadlines that we've uh, checked with the, the researched and checked with the county elections official are still applicable um, as, as we've previously advised. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings and City Attorney. Are there any other council questions before I bring it out to public comment? Okay. Going out to public comment. If you are interested in commenting on second reading and adoption of ordinance number 2022-06, raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. And when it's your turn to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The timer will then be set to three minutes. The first hand raise has a phone number ending in 1705. Go ahead and unmute. Hello, hello. can you hear me? Yes, hello, welcome. Great, uh, yes, thank you for taking my, my comments today. Um, like Council Member Cummings, I have some reservations that uh, the switch to district elections will result in any sort of fair representation. I, I like the at-large system. However, I totally understand why Council is doing this and I think it's appropriate. So I differ with Cummings, uh, Councilmember Cummings on that. But more importantly, this idea 
that somehow the council's actions are illegal or just the opinion of the city attorney or unconstitutional, that's just totally wrong. Uh, Government Code Section 34886 expressly gives council the uh, ability, the power to go to district elections without a public vote. And even though we are, we are a charter city, this section was put into place by the legislature specifically for charter cities. Let me read you the relevant passage. The legislate, this is government code section 34886. The legislative body of a city may adopt an ordinance that requires the members of the legislative body to be elected by district or by district with an elective mayor without being required to submit the ordinance to the voters for approval. Now, uh, Council Member Cummings and other people, members of the public, have said that Council's actions are unconstitutional. By inference, the only thing that could mean is that he believes that this government code statute is unconstitutional. However, a statute is not unconstitutional because a council member says it is or because a Stanford Law School graduate says it is. It's only unconstitutional when a court rules it is. And usually, in most cases, that court would have to be an appellate court. It would have to be a published decision of an appellate court. So I don't know if Council Member Cummings is misguided or if he doesn't understand that, but it's really, there's a difference between someone's opinion about what the city should do and whether or not it's illegal. And like I said at the beginning, I think we'd be better served by sticking with that large election. This is my opinion. It doesn't mean what the council has done is illegal. And I think Council Member Cummings and others could do better by saying, it's my opinion that a court might rule this unconstitutional. Because clearly, it's not unconstitutional now. And City Attorney uh, Condotti's generous characterization that that's a lay opinion is just that, it's generous. It's not a lay opinion. It's a fact that it's not unconstitutional because it's only unconstitutional if a court rules it has. It is, and there have been no court rulings on this whatsoever. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next public comment is phone number ending in 9642. Hi there, welcome. Can you go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself? Hello, um, do you hear? Hi there, welcome. Thank you. Um, I would like to register my disappointment on the majority vote uh, to select map six. Hello? You're muted. I think she's trying to mute her the streaming, which is okay. the delay that she's hearing, and she accidentally muted her phone too. Okay, there we go. Hi, I think I, it's great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to register my disappointment. The streaming, which is the delay that she's hearing, and she accidentally muted her phone. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, continue talking. Hello? Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for your patience. Um, I, thank you. Thank you. I would like to register my disappointment on the majority vote uh, to select NAP 602. Um, on my, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello? I can so hear you. Can you hear me? That they, that they turn off their streaming devices, what, lower the volume. What is happening is, um, yes. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello? We can hear you, but there's uh, an echo from your um, whatever is playing the meeting. There's a delay, so you'll have to mute that. Oh, 
I can't because on my screen I'm only showing the directions of how to comment. So there is no, uh, so I would have to go back, I guess, to live. Hello. We can hear you, but there is uh, an echo. Okay. Um, whatever. Our, okay. Okay, I can't mute it because on my screen, I only see the directions to um, address the city council on my um, uh, with a phone. Okay. I did not having a live. So go ahead Can and I, just, um, just talk without the and ignore the mayor. Yes, I, I think you can also just hit pause on the streaming. No, don't mute. Okay, let me try just that. Hit pause. Okay, let me let me try that. I did not having a live. Okay, there. I think this will uh, um, help that because I press stop. Okay, can you hear me now without the echoing? Yes. Hi. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Of course. Um, I would like to register my disappointment on the majority vote to select Map 602 at the April 19th Special City Council meeting. And my objections are based on the California Voting Rights Project report entitled Abridgement of Latino Voting Rights and Racially Polarized Voting in the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, this was uh, published February 2020. And this report was cited in a Santa Cruz local article as a contribution by Jessica York, a Santa Cruz a Sentinel reporter. Um, my first concern was that the report was not available on the city map. I only found it by accident. But it gave detailed uh, data and charts showing why they came to the conclusion that a voting characterized candidate elections and other electoral choices in the city of Santa Cruz. It further stated and concluded that there is also significant evidence of the extent to which Latinos in the city of Santa Cruz bear the effects of past discrimination in such areas as education, employment, and health. Um, so I'd like to make some points on um, the choice of the map based on this report and the data made available for the district map. Um, the choice of map 602 over 604B dilutes in District 4 the percent of Latino registered voters by 6%. Now, it's, uh, the district maps may not be drawn with race as the predominant factor in violation of the principles established by the U.S. Supreme Court, but predominant does not mean to exclude it's that race cannot be a factor. Uh, the CVRP report states that it would be possible to create approximately three city council districts with proportions of members of protected classes significantly greater than the city as a whole. Now, race is a protected class at the state and federal level, so this could have been done. Uh, the other point I'd like to make is that the choice of map 602 over 604B reduces in District 4 the percent of renters by 15%. The choice of MAP 602 over 604B increases in, in District 4 by 10% the number of households with incomes over 75%. The choice of MAP 602 over 604 joins uh, Lower Ocean with Seabright, and Lower Ocean is a neighborhood that has more in common with beach rats than it does with million-dollar homes on top of the hill. This also includes Lower Ocean business clientele, which has more in common with the beach flats. Okay, thank you for hearing me out. Um, there were some other points, but I Your time I'm is thankful up. that you were able to hear these. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your comment. I'm glad we worked through that uh, troubleshooting as well. Um, I see Casey Hemard, you popped on. <laughs> Are you available for any uh, questions or any? I, I am here, as, and our demographer Doug Johnson is also here, um, who can, uh, who's more of a subject matter expert on on some of the mapping uh, details and CBRA, as as well as Cassie Bronson's here too. Wonderful. Um, it looks like that concludes our public comment. Um, I don't see other attendees, so I will bring it back to council for comments, deliberation, and action, and um, for this second reading on this item. And 
Um, oh, I see one more public comment. I will go back and just make sure I grab that. Phone number ending in 2174. Are you commenting on this agenda item 18? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bruner. I'm sorry, I uh, just got in and uh, just quickly dialed to come to make a comment. Um, I'd like to speak on behalf of so many people who are uh, just beginning to realise your choice, the choice that the council majority made on the maps and are puzzled, confused, concerned and outraged. So I'd like to express all of that and specifically... Uh, I think uh, other callers, although I missed the public comment, have spoken about how you have divided the Latino community. I'd like to add to that concern, because time will go quickly here, um, the way that uh, the West Side has been split is just unconscionable. Um, that you have divided the Lower West Side vertically and the Upper West Side vertically, it makes no sense except maybe someone's thinking of running for council and could get votes that way. It makes the, the Voting Rights Act, the, um, uh, the, the act of which you've been following, requires you to divide districts of mutual interest and not leapfrog. Well, you've, <laughs> you've divided the map so that Highway 1 goes through the middle by dividing it vertically. The Upper West Side and the Lower West Side have quite different interests. That is obvious to anyone who's lived here for any time. The, in, the impacts of beach traffic uh, and children crossing Delaware to get to school on their bicycles impacts the Lower West Side. Above Highway 1 or above Mission, the Upper West Side has its own issues. To divide those, and one of the maps goes straight, straight through the Circles neighbourhood, uh, it, it, it makes no sense. It doesn't appear to comply with the, the criteria on which you were supposed to create districts. And I think it's going to prove uh, to be a problem going into the future as uh, people who represent, who are elected to represent districts, now will not be representing districts with common interests, but will be split in half. Uh, as for uh, dividing Lower Ocean from beach flats, and uh, maybe you cannot take race as the only criterion, but you certainly can use uh, race and ethnicity and common interests of lower income residents in your deliberations to choose a map, and you have violated that premise. So on every level, the choice of maps you have made is a disservice to the community, and uh, I would question its uh, conformance with the law. And uh, I thank you. Thank you for your comment. We have another hand raised, the name I am watching you. Go ahead and unmute. Yes, hello. Um, I've, I've spoken to this before, uh, any problems I, I might have had with Measure E, mostly a disappointment that it wasn't uh, well, that it's uh, somewhat lopsided and unfair, but as far as the districts, they're not treated equally. Uh, but I, I don't have any problem with the maps. I think that's fine. Um, you know, dividing the lower west side is, uh, if anything, it's like twice as much representation. You know, it's almost better. Um, but uh, my real concern is that, uh, well, in case the Measure E, you know, fails, and I, I really don't know how I'm going to vote. I probably think that Measure E is better than what we do now. As far as electing city council, but uh, you know the, the uh, alternative, which is this default seven district, you know that just there's nothing going for that for me, and so it's not much of a choice. But it seems like you could make the seven district uh, option better by somehow allowing the public to vote for whoever's on the council uh, for mayor, and I don't see why we, you can't do that and. Uh, even if it's just an, I know you've got to change the charter uh, to make it stick, but uh, you could still do an advisory vote even without the charter, and you could always change the charter later. Uh, and I, 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 I think uh, if you could uh, explain why you, you know you wouldn't want to do that, 
uh, or that you would intend to do that if it passed, uh, uh, or if you failed, I mean, then, uh, you know, that would give people a better choice. And uh, it could actually be a very competitive option to measure. Um, I, uh, I also think a two-year mayor is better just because I believe in uh, public oversight and the more the better. And, uh, and it solves a lot of these district unfairness type problems. And, uh, you know, I could see uh, a seven district with uh, a two-year term mayor being voted on by the public, at least in an advisory capacity, if, if not a, a charter change. Thanks. Our next public comment is the name Anita. Go ahead and unmute. Hello. Hi, welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks again to Council Member Lantari Johnson for answering my questions on this item this morning. Um, there was missing postings uh, that were an integral part of the ordinance that was not with this agenda item, specifically Exhibit A and Exhibit B. That has now been posted, uh, but Exhibit A is for 604B, but the ordinance refers to uh, map 602, and Exhibit B refers to map 101, but posted as 101D. So I really have no idea what is actually being adopted here. Can you clarify what's happening here? Hello? My public comment is not a dialogue period. It's a time for you to give your public comment in, in the, the time allotted. Okay. Uh, well, I've stated there's conflicts of what the ordinance says is being adopted versus what's posted on your agenda. Does that conclude your public comment? Uh, yeah, that I object to this proceeding without proper um, maps being posted on what is actually being adopted. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay. Looks like that concludes our public comment period. I don't see any other attendees with their hands raised. I will now bring it back to uh, council for comments uh, and deliberation and action on this second reading and adoption of ordinance number 2022-06. Um, I would like to start maybe by answering a couple of the questions in um, that were brought up during public comment. And um, one of the, the callers questioned um, their comment, questioned the legal aspect um, of the maps. And I'm wondering if Someone can speak to that, the demographer uh, or Casey Himard. I'll defer to Doug on the legality of the maps that, we, that were selected by the council. Sure. Uh, Mayor, members of council, just briefly, um, both the maps that the council has adopted and the other maps that were proposed at the last meeting meet all the legal requirements. Um, there obviously are differences of opinion about which maps best meet them, but they all meet the legal requirements. Thank you. Um, there was another question regarding um, seven districts allowing for an elect mayor. Um, oh, God. 
Go ahead, Tony. Uh, the, I think the question was, can uh, we have seven districts and allow the public to select among willing council members to serve as mayor? And the reason why that's problematic, if Measure E does not pass and the city council adopts district elections by ordinance. Someone's not muted. Yeah, um, it's, uh, yeah. And I think uh, Anita is still, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so, so the reason why that's problematic is um, Measure E would amend the charter to specify having a directly elected at-large mayor. And if Measure E does not pass and the city council moves forward with seven council districts by ordinance, then the existing provision of the charter, section 604, I believe, uh, would require that the mayor be selected by the city council. So, so that's why with uh, the seven district maps, um, the council would continue to select the mayor because it's specified by the charter. Okay. And the last question brought up was regarding the supporting documents in conflict with what's stated in the ordinance. Yeah, I, uh, Mayor Bruner, this is Casey. Um, I, I, I actually have wrapped up my time at the city about two weeks ago, so I have not actually been involved with loading these. Uh, since my temporary project management role, I thought was going to expire on May 10th, I, I, I've left. So I've not been involved. I, I was not there to make sure that the uh, exhibits were attached. Um, so I, I'm guessing that there's probably an, an, an error um, in an inadvertent error in somebody trying to be really helpful and loading uh, the maps uh, as attachments when this was brought to the city's attention. Um, any other comments? This is Doug, I would just add that uh, just as a reminder, I don't know about the details of the agenda packet, but all the maps throughout this whole process are all still available on the um, project website and on the CC. And, and I will add the city's uh, transition to district elections website clearly marks which maps the uh, council selected on the date. It's, it's uh, very clearly noted and has been since the day after the council first chose those maps. Thank you. Um, and then City Clerk, Bonnie Bush. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to say we um, inadvertently added the wrong maps, but I was going to say what Casey indicated that on the website it does um, specify that on April 19th which maps were adopted or approved. Right. Thank you. Um, okay. Sorry for that confusion. I'm glad we were able to clarify that. So um, the ordinance in the agenda with um, the maps shown, not the exhibits, the exhibits are incorrect and the agenda is correct. Is that the case? It sounds like that's, yeah. That, that okay. sounds correct, Mayor Bruner, yeah. And city attorney, do you have any comment on this? Um, it, it's an unfortunate oversight, but it does not affect the legality of the proceedings that are before you today. Okay, thank you. Um, council member Cummings, uh, sorry, council member Brown, the squares moved. <laughs> Go ahead. I saw your hand up and then Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, yeah, I, so I, well, I was going to ask a follow-up question about the, um, any pot potential concerns about the legality given the um, confusion around the postings, um, given that this, I mean, this is a very confusing issue. And in the conversations I've been having with people in the community, uh, some of whom were very excited about supporting Measure E because they liked the idea of an at-large mayor who then heard about what was happening with the maps have changed their perspective. And more people are um, beginning to try to understand this. And the fact that we have not made this 
um, legible to the general public in a way that's really accessible is very concerning to me. Um, I um, so so I think that you know we've got some serious work to do here, and I think that we are um, opening ourselves up to uh, the potential for uh, complaints about you know related to the potentially to the Brown Act because this information was you know you have to really pull it apart and know what's going on to be able to access all of the documents and there was um, a misrepresentation about those exhibits for this um, this meeting um, you know I, I just think that given this kind of change um, you know and I recognize that staff has been you know trying to <laughs> roll with the punches here of what you know some council members brought very last minute to uh, this public body and um, you know, it just seems to me that we ought to be taking that more seriously. So, you know, I'm. I guess the question's been asked and answered, but I'm not satisfied with the answer. And I believe we need to, um, you know, re-notice this. And I also, uh, am, you know, inclined to suggest that given the um, the significant concerns with the sixth district map that was selected by this the council majority. Um, or a majority of council members um, that we should really be reconsidering that map um, before, uh, and that should be done after, you know, perhaps after the election. So, um, you know, I'm not going to support moving forward with this ordinance second reading today. I think we need to be um, looking at this after the election um, and give people time to decide, do they want six districts and a mayor um, without all of this confusion about <laughs> what the map and what it means, um, or um, you know, be prepared for uh, a legal challenge. I, I think that's that's what's in the cards here, if if uh, the council majority moves forward in this way. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Um, Casey Hemard. Yes. Um, I also, I wanted to also just let you all know. Um, the last thing I did before I left the city on May 11th was um, I physically posted um, in the spots where we, uh, we post council noticings outside of council chambers and over on Church Street. Um, a notice that also sp explicitly st states that the city on April 19th, the city council selected district maps 101 and 602 and introduced the ordinance. Um, I also uh, posted this particular notice on the transition to district elections website and um, marked the different, uh, marked it in several different places that this that these were the two maps selected on April 19th, just for your information. Thank you. Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I do wanna appreciate the comments and also the um, folks who are here to help sort of refine our responses to this item and specifically call out Casey um, for coming back even after not um, necessarily being with the city anymore. We appreciate you. Um, I also really wanna thank our demographer for really clear clarifying that these are all legally viable options. I know that's been um, stated as um, not true, but um, what it is is true. And I think it's important for us to be very clear about that because probably what the biggest threat to democracy is, is really the um, lack of clarity of information and um, being really clear about what's legally viable is essential. I also want to um, make sure that the community knows that the maps have been publicly available on our website and clearly articulated on our website for weeks. And um, this has now been delayed as an item because we wanted to ensure that we were really clear specifically with the title and action for this community. So I do believe that we've done our due diligence in that way. Um, therefore, I'm prepared to move the uh, ordinance and the second reading of the ordinance, um, item number 18. And I don't think I need to read that. I don't think I need to reread it, but I'm happy to make that motion. Okay, we have a motion by Vice Mayor Watkins is there a second and then we can continue discussion? Council member Boulder? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Watkins to move the second reading and a, a second by Council member Boulder. Um, 
Thank you. And um, Council Member Brown, I saw your hand went back up. Um, did you just, have a? Just really quick, um, I, I received a message as I often do when we are on Zoom from a member of the public who was trying to call in and did not get called on, um, wasn't able to, the raise hand function didn't work. Um, and so I'm hoping that that, and it looks like um, I see a hand up now in the attendees. So I'm, I'm hoping that um, people who, given that this is probably the last opportunity people have to weigh in that you'd um, give that individual an opportunity to speak. Okay, so we have um, a member of the public who was trying to call in for public comment, it sounds like. Let me go to the attendees list. Is it okay? Um, I'm going to go out and then come back to council to give this member an opportunity to speak. Okay, um, I see a hand raised with the name Anne. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, Mayor Bruner. I just wanted to quickly add that uh, I, as a member of this community for 46 years, almost 47 now, that these maps do not represent neighborhoods that deserve to have representation. What they do is they seem to be reflective of council members wanting to be reelected more than it has to do with keeping lower ocean, with, with uh, beach flats, with keeping uh, communities together. This is, uh, it's outrageous to think that Lower Ocean is connected with Highland Avenue. If you couldn't take two more disparate groups of people and think that that is a community and you should all be ashamed of yourself for voting for that. And I, I'm just fed up. It's very, dis it's very discouraging what's going on with this community. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your comment. I'm bringing back to council and um, I see council member Boulder, you have your hand raised and then council member Cummings. Could I, could I interject a comment? Um, I'd just like to clarify something for the record. Um, there was a comment about the wrong map being posted on the, in the agenda packet. And I just wanna clarify that, um, First of all, the ordinance that was included in the agenda packet did refer to district map 101 and district map 602, but those maps were initially omitted from the packet. So there weren't maps in the packet. The correct maps were referred to, um, but the maps were not attached. And that was corrected yesterday, but any, any person who re reviewed the ordinance would have received the information about the correct maps. It's just that they weren't included as part of the packet. Okay, thank you. Council member Golder. So I just wanna say that um, to, to respond to the, the members of the public that think that we drew the maps or you know gerrymandered the maps in some way that those of us on council could get reelected. I, I just want to dispel that notion and say that couldn't be further from the truth. I think all seven of us, you know, have um, <laughs> no desire to do anything like that and have nothing but the long term, you know, vision for the best Santa Cruz in, in our hearts, all seven of us. And so um, the other thing is, I, I agree with what council member Watkins said and that the maps have been very clear and posted um, throughout the process. We didn't draw the maps, the demographers did. We chose the map that we felt was best given the information we were provided. And I think the people that are saying they're confused are not actually confused. They're just not happy with the ones that we chose. And so it's just disappointing to see um, people act, you know, acting like this and accusing people of things that aren't accurate. So that's all. Okay, thank you, council member Cummings. I just wanna, you know, express that I've heard a lot of concern around transparency, which we're seeing unfold before us today. 
um, and also about around the uncertainty of the outcome of Measure E. Um, I think it would be much more transparent of a process if we wait until after the election to select these maps. Many people have said they've had difficulty finding the maps, and I believe once we know what direction the community will be going in, we can then have a special meeting so that the community can weigh in on which map will be best at ensuring representation in our local government. So I'm gonna make a substitute motion to continue this item until after the election to provide more transparency. Second. Okay, we have a substitute motion by council member Cummings to continue until after June, the election, okay, after the election with a second by council member Brown. Um, curious on the, the timeline of that, if that, um, what that affects. Uh, city attorney. I'm not quite sure. I mean, one of the things that we need to be able to do is submit the maps to the uh, elections official before July 6th. Uh, we have an ordinance that adopts the maps and the ordinance doesn't take effect for 30 days after its final adoption. So it may be possible to uh, return with a resolution adopting the maps, but I um, I would have to research that. Oh, my, <laughs> Cassie's just pointing out that because it relates to an election, the ordinance uh, goes into effect immediately. So uh, I stand correct on that. Uh, I see city clerk Bonnie Bush also has um, her hand raised. I do, thank you, just um, a follow up. The, counts, uh, the county clerk would have 30 days after the election to certify the election. So I don't know if your intention is to wait until the results are in, in which case it would be too late. It would be too it late. Would, it would be too off. late to come back and adopt the ordinance because you'd have to have a, um, another meeting to adopt this ordinance but then the county would need the maps by July 6th, if that makes sense. So 30 days from the election would be July 7th. So timing wise, there wouldn't be enough time to have another meeting to adopt this ordinance based on the results of the election. Okay. Um... This is good discussion. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, well, given this information that it's not viable, in addition to the fact that this has been vetted as part of our community and outreach process, I'm wondering if the maker of the motion wants to withdraw the motion or if we want to go ahead and take the vote on it, which in which case, given what we know, I'm going to vote no because it makes no sense. Does the maker of the motion want to withdraw the motion? No. Okay, is there any other discussion on the substitute? Okay. Um, so we have a substitute motion, Council Member Cummings, and a second by Council Member Brown. Um, and we'll have a roll call vote for accepting that motion. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. No. Holder? No. Coming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? No. Vice Mayor Watkins? No. And Mayor Brunner? No. So the substitute motion does not pass five uh, against two in favor. And that brings us back to our motion. Is there any further discussion on that motion? 
Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, given that we're moving in this direction, um, and based on what we've heard from the community, our decision here is to really be addressing racially polarized voting. Of all the maps, map 604B for six districts and 101D for seven districts would best increase representation of Latinos, Asians, low-income residents, and students to be on our uh, city council. We have an opportunity before us to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion of people from a protected class in our elections. And I believe the best way to promote racial representation, student representation, and representation by working class and low-income residents is to go with the staff recommendation. So I'm gonna make a substitute motion that we adopt maps 604B and 101D um, for district elections. Second. Okay, we have a substitute motion by Council Member Cummings to adopt 604B map and 101D map with a second by Council Member Brown. Okay, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Yeah, I'd like some clarification from staff. This isn't the agenda item. We're voting on the charter amendment, correct? Can I? Uh, no, you voted on the charter amendment uh, at, a, at a prior meeting. This is the ordinance by which the district maps are selected and also that uh, specifies the process for uh, a seven district election uh, should measure E uh, fail at the June 7th primary election. So the, mo the motion that's put forward isn't what's on the agenda. Correct. What's on the agenda is the ordinance that incorporates maps 602 and 101. I understood the substitute motion would be to, to remove those references and substitute the, uh, the maps that Council Member Cummings was referring to. But we're voting on the ordinance, not on the maps. So that's why this motion doesn't make much sense to me. It's both the ordinance and the maps that are incorporated by reference into the ordinance. The ordinance includes the maps. So yes, we are voting on the ordinance or the ordinance is before us, but the ordinance includes two maps. And that we're already voted on. Voted on. Say that again? That we're already voted on based on staff recommendation. At the, at the first reading, correct. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Yeah, I think, I guess I'll just say that this sort of to the point that Councilmember Kalantari Johnson was bringing was, this is the second reading. So I will be voting no on the substitute motion. And also just want to, again, point out that what we had was a series of maps that had been um, vetted by our demographer who has um, really taken into consideration the dem demographics of our community. So they're all very different options that we do the best we can to choose from. So no map is the perfect map, but we want is hopefully a map that we think will provide the best representation and split of representation throughout the entire community. So in regards to, I think, again, some of the misinformation that I'm hearing, which is that it's not rooted in um, or it's not viable or has um, sort of racially polarizing components that it's not democratic, which is factually incorrect. And frankly, to me, is the biggest threat to our democracy if we're having fake news brought before us or fake facts brought forward, that's not true. So for me, I feel comfortable moving forward with the second ordinance and I'll be voting now on the substitute motion again. Council member Brown. Well, I just ra had raised my hand to correct a statement that Council Member Kalantari Johnson made about um, this ordinance being an ordinance with maps that were recommended by staff, which was not the case. Um, the Council Member Kalantari Johnson chose to move and five members of the council supported other maps that were not recommended by staff. They were included in the menu of options that were given. And um, while 
the assertion has been made that they um, are not that they are legal and they, they are legal because there is no legal precedent <laughs> suggesting that they they are not legal at this moment. It's really an empirical question as one of our callers um, suggested. Um, it's an empirical question that will not be answered until there is a judgment in, a, in and it's put into case law. And um, that is a concern that I have um, moving forward. And um, so I, I'm, I absolutely support uh, returning to this, the original staff recommendation. I recall during the meeting when we were discussing the maps that were presented to us by the demographer um, at the time, the demographer did say in particular, specifically with respect to the question of uh, lower ocean and beach flats, a clear community of interest being divided when it does not need to be, um, that um, the demographers used the river as a natural dividing line. Um, and I say this with no disrespect <laughs> for the demographer, but that is clearly um, an indication of not being particularly familiar with our community. And it's a different thing to look at census tracts and uh, demographics in census tracts and to actually understand our community. When that input was provided, the demographer said, well, we can certainly do that. And that's what happened. The council majority chose to ignore that possibility. And um, I guess, again, I'm not gonna debate whether or not it's legal, we'll find out down the road, I suppose. Um, but I, if I really just, and, you know, and, and then I just have to say that the idea that calling these maps questionable is fake news is just so disheartening to hear, um, to, you know, to refer to, uh, you know, something that, you know, uh, an elected leader that I don't think any of us want to emulate, um, you know, something that he, he used is, is just, it's really, um, I, I just don't understand it. Um, so while I had the floor, I just felt the need to add that as well. And I'm sorry that this has become so incredibly, um, you know, emotional for uh, the community. I, guess, I suppose there's some emotion there as people are finding out about it, but for council members to um, to not see that the decisions that are being made here do have an impact on those in our community who have been voiceless or close to voiceless and who are were the subject of this original um, legal claim under the California Voting Rights Act. So. I'll be voting yes uh, to consider the substitute motion. And um, I imagine we'll find out more as the community moves forward with the response. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins and then Council Member Cummings. Sorry, there's just construction starting near me. I, can you hear me okay? Hopefully yeah. it's okay. Um, yeah, no, I just, I mean, I guess I'll clarify my comments since I have the floor. I, I guess my concern is that when you have comments made that this is an undemocratic process or that we are gerrymandering maps, that's not true. And, and frankly, what we see happen is politicians specifically using an, their own set of data or information to further their a political agenda and that is concerning to me and frankly is exactly what's a concern for um, our democracy so i think that there may be a difference around the individual um, maps that are chosen in terms of weighing all of them but in terms of the representation that went into it in terms of how our demographer figured those out um, those were vetted by an expert which we heard so for me, I'm comfortable moving forward with the original um, maps. I think we could go round and round. And given that um, this is the second reading, I'm happy to just call the question in terms of the substitute motion. So we can just take a vote on that. Okay. The question has been called, so let's take a roll call vote. Needs to be voted on. Do you have a second on that? Oh. A question. Okay. So the question has been called second by council member Brown. No, I'm sorry. I wasn't, um, we, we can call the question and do the whole vote. I okay. don't know if there are any other comments. Question by but, Vice Mayor Watkins and a second. I'll second it. Need a second. We can just keep going. Myers. Okay. <laughs> And 
um, so question by Vice Mayor Watkins, question has been called, second by Myers, roll call vote. Council member is Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Holder. Aye. Come No. Brown. No. Myers. Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins. Aye. And Mayor Brunner. Aye. Um, okay, so the question has been called and now we go to the substitute motion. To the main motion. Oh, okay, gotcha. You vote on the substitute motion now. Substitute motion and then um, we'll go from there. So, Substitute motion, council member Cummings seconded by Brown on uh, uh, replacing the, the two maps with 604B and 101D. Roll call vote. Council member is Kalantari Johnson. No. Holder. No. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? No. Vice Mayor Watkins? No. And Mayor Bruner? No. Okay, so now we are at the main motion. There was a first by uh, Vice Mayor Watkins and a second by Council Member Golder. And um, we'll take a roll call vote. Council oh. Member Kalantari Johnson. Mayor Bruner. Sorry, I, Council Member Brown. Yeah, if, if um, we'll need another uh, calling the question to cut off conversation discussion about this particular motion. So if somebody wants to do that next, feel free to go ahead and do that. But I'm going to make my comments now that they were related to, you know, the general issue. So I think they're just as applicable now. <laughs> um, so, you know, I just wanted again to you know, it's been suggested that um, some council members may have a political agenda here. And in response to that, I want to say, yes, I absolutely do have a political agenda here. My political agenda is to ensure that underrepresented voices are heard and are, rep are better represented in the decisions we make. That is my political agenda. And I'm very proud of that. Um, and so the idea that having a political agenda is um, inappropriate to me is also very dismaying. And um, I think we just need to be transparent about what our particular personal or not necessarily personal each and individual, but what our, um, what our political agendas are. I would like transparency among all of my colleagues on that. Um, I'm making mine transparent and I'd be happy to talk more about that with people offline. I wanna take up more time here um, because clearly the decision has been made, but um, I do want to state that for the record. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll make my final comments as well. And just want to point out that the reason why we're in this entire process is to address racially polarized voting and to increase representation in our local government. At the last city council meeting, the item that was on our agenda stated that the staff recommendation for these maps were the following. The NDC has revised the initial draft maps in response to feedback received at the public hearing on March 29th. Staff recommends that the council select map 604B as it's the most effectively, and it most effectively incorporates the majority of the feedback received from the community. 
at the public hearing, and then that was for the the six district map. For the seven district map, it said that, quote, at the public hearing on March 29th and in the city's whole co survey, the community and the city council indicated that map 101 was the preferred model with a few modifications. The staff recommends that the council select map 101D as it most effectively incorporates the majority of the feedback received. Our job is to work on behalf of the community. And our job is to ensure that diverse voices are heard. It's something that we've been committed to. And the recommendations that were brought forward by staff not only incorporated the feedback from the council, but from the community and were the best maps to address racially polarized voting. Those maps are not being voted on today. And, um, and those are the maps that we should be going with because it's coming from an impartial group. Um, so similar to council member Brown, my political agenda is to make sure that there's representation for low income, working class, people of color, all people on this board because it's been, it hasn't been that way for so long. And again, the reason why we're here and we're making these decisions on moving to district elections is to address racially polarized voting. That's what we should be going with and that's what we should be doing, but that's not what the outcome of this vote will be today. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, you know, the maps, I will just say, um, the, the, the maps that were brought forward from um, initial community input and some of the initial uh, uh, engagement that we had and um, with 604B and 101D as um, options that were added after some of that initial put input, there was continued input uh, once those options were um, um, posted and, and shared on the site. So um, all of these maps do uh, take into account various uh, demographics from age to income, uh, ethnicity, um, and I uh, encourage everyone to look on the website or come to City Hall to see all of those um, percentages and statistics to understand this discussion as we really move forward to um, really incorporate some of the um, uh, input that we've received and the, the, the best uh, uh, um, map options as we move forward. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, been a, it's been a really hard uh, uh, navigation through all of the information and the different various options. Um, they're all slightly different and um, hopefully we can uh, have the best, the best results um, from this process. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I just want to acknowledge uh, city staff and the demographers for all of their incredible work. Um, it is disheartening to see some of the grandstanding given that there's been so much work put into this. So I just want to acknowledge and thank um, the whole team for the work that's been put into this over the last year. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Um, it, it looks like there's no other council comments or input. Then we do have a motion on the table and I like to ask for a roll call vote, please. Council members Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Holder. Aye. Coming. No. Brown. No. Myers. Aye. Watkins, uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Aye. And Mayor Brunner. Aye. And that motion passes 
with five in favor to no. Okay. Um, can I just pull up uh, city staff again and just a quick clarification for next steps on this item for the public to understand? Um, I can't speak to the city's efforts on educating people on, on what's going to happen with Measure E. The material on our website has to stay there for, an, I think it's 10 years. Um, Doug may be able to speak to that. And um, all the resources from this process will remain there for a long, long time. I see demographer Doug Johnson and city manager Matt Huffaker, as well as city attorney. Yeah, just want to clear everyone the the ten year requirement, as he mentions, is in the Fair Maps Act. But like the dates you talked about, it only applies to redistricting. So the city, the city will keep these records as it does all city records. But there's no special record keeping for this. Just to clarify that one. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Uh, okay, city manager or city attorney. Uh, I will just add that. This is the last action that the city council has to take in order to move forward with the district elections process. And it really is at this point in the hands of the voters as to whether or not uh, we will have an election with uh, six districts and an at-large mayor uh, if Measure E passes or seven districts if it does not. Okay, thank you. All right. Quick question, Vice Mayor, since we have Doug back on. I wonder if, Doug, you want to just clarify in regards to sort of the racial polarizing and kind of, you know, the balance of that within the various maps that none of them specifically. Do you want to, do you want to speak to that? One of order. I mean, mine is, I'm happy, if, but if we're going to go back and forth on uh, questions with the demographer, I mean, the item was just voted on. So if council member um, Watkins is going to ask questions and I think it also opens us up for more questions for all the council members so I don't know how that plays out in terms of process but um, and I'm happy if we want to reopen this item and start asking more questions but we just took a vote and that was the question. No, it's fine because it's fine, you already said it Doug. that's fine you already said it was fine they were all legally viable I already heard that don't don't worry about it I withdraw yeah. my question I'm factual Mayor and Councilor, I'll just say that if there are follow-up questions, you know, we're not going anywhere. We're happy to answer anything you want to send us after this meeting. Thank you so much, Doug Johnson. Appreciate your work. Thanks for being with us today. Um, okay, I will pull back to my agenda here. Um, so next up on our agenda is item number 19, Historic Preservation Commission appointment. And for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be questions from council followed by public comment and then return to council for nominations and action. We have um, our presenter of this item is our city clerk, Bonnie Bush. Thank you, Mayor, you said everything. Okay, thank you. And um, are there any questions from council at this time? No questions, okay. And um, let's go out to our members of the public for any uh, member input, any public comment on agenda item number 19, historic preservation commitment, uh, Commission. <laughs> All right. And I'm not seeing any attendees with their hands raised, seeing none. I will pull it back to council for nominations. And 
we did have applications. Will you be calling nominations, city clerk? Roll call, or shall I just yeah. go around? I, I can do it. Um, just in FYI, there is one opening, so you just nominate one person. Um, Council member Kalantari Johnson, do you have a nominee? Um, Frank Swartz. Swart, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the last name correctly. Councilmember Golder. You're muted. William Schultz. Councilmember Cumming. Brown. N nothing new. Councilmember Meyer. My uh, my person's been uh, put forward. Thanks. Vice Mayor Watkin. Same. And Mayor Bruner. Same. Okay, so now we'll do a roll call vote between William Schultz and Frank Swart. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Frank Swart. Holder. William Schultz. I, no, I'm, going, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm going to go with Zort. Frank. I'm going to go with Frank, actually. Frank Zort. Um, council member coming. You're muted. Frank Zort. Councilmember Brown. Frank Swart. Myers. Frank Swart. Vice Mayor Watkins. Same. Frank Swart. And Mayor Bruner. Frank Swart. We have Frank Swart with a term ending in January 31st, 2024. Thank you. Okay. Um, Frank Swart is now appointed to Historic Preservation Commission. Thank you so much. We will move on to our next agenda item now, 20 Sister Cities Committee appointment. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Uh, we did not have any public comment. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, double checking my note. Next up is item 20, Sister Cities Committee appointment. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be questions from council followed by public comment. We will then return to council for their nominations and action. And uh, I will hand it to city clerk, Bonnie Bush. Is there anything else to add? Um, thank you, Mayor. Just one thing to add. There are two openings with two different term limits. So when we do the vote, the person with the most number of votes will get the longer term. Okay. All right. Um, are there any questions from council members? Seeing none, I will take it out to public comment on our sister cities committee appointment. Um, if this is an item you'd like to comment on, raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature webinar controls on your computer. 
And I am not seeing any attendees with their hands raised. I'm happy to bring it back to council for nominations. And city clerk, can you call the nominations? Thank you. I'll switch it up a little bit. Um, council member Brown. I'd like to nominate uh, Linda Snook and Amy West. Vice Mayor Watkins. I will add um, Michael Tassio. Councilmember Golder. I don't have anybody to add. Councilmember Cummings. No new additions. Vice uh, Mayor Brunner. No new additions. And Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Nothing to add. Councilmember Myers. No new additions. So we have three um, nominees, Linda Snook, Michael Tassio, and Amy West, and two openings. Um, again, the person with the most number of votes will get the longer term ending in 2026. Calent uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. I give my two votes. Is that is that how it works? That's right. Okay. Um, Amy West and Michael Tassio. Councilmember Golder. Well, I served on Sister Cities with Linda. I think it's time to give other people a chance. So Amy and Michael, my two. Councilmember Cumming. Amy West and Linda Snook. Councilmember Brown. Amy West and Linda Snook. Councilmember Myers. Amy West and Michael Tassio. Vice Mayor Watkins. Michael Tassio and Linda Snook. And Mayor Brunner. Linda Snook and Michael Tassio. Okay. So we have um, Amy West and one. Amy West and Michael Tassi are tied at five votes each. Um, so we do need to do a vote just on those two to determine who gets the longer term. Am I good to go? Okay. Councilmember Kellen, sorry, Johnson has her hand raised. All right, I just had a clarifying question. So were Amy West and Michael Tasio the top two then? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. I have I have Linda Snook as having four four votes. I see. So, okay. And the other two as five. Okay. So so I just vote on one of those then. I see. Okay. You Amy vote West. on uh, Michael Tasio or Amy West. Yeah. Amy West. Thank you. Councilmember Golder. Amy West. Did you hear me? Councilmember Cumming. Amy West. Councilmember Brown. Amy West. Councilmember Myers. Amy West. Vice Mayor Watkins. Amy West. <laughs> And Mayor Brunner. Amy West. Okay, so Amy West got the most votes and her term is ending January 31st, 2026. And Michael Tassio, his term will end January 31st, 2023. Thank you. Let me go back to my agenda. Okay, thank you so much uh, to Amy West, 
and Michael Tasio for serving on our sister cities committee. At this time, we will take a brief um, break uh, and we will return at 315. We will continue then with item number 21 on our agenda. Thank you. with our agenda today. Is the city clerk ready? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will now continue on with our next agenda item. And this is Agenda item number 21, impact report for the empty home tax initiative petition. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation from staff followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. In addition to the public comment, we will be hearing on this item four emails were sent in to city council at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com. I will now hand it over and welcome Bobby McGee, our interim director of finance. Hello, Bobby. Hello, thank you, uh, Mayor Bruner and uh, members of the council. Um, the next item before you um, is related to the empty home tax um, initiative petition, which is a citizen based initiative. Um, there's a process for getting these types of items out in in front of the voters, which is outlined in the in the staff report. And at this time, um, you can see that this has been moving forward. And so in reading uh, the full text of this proposed um, ordinance change, uh, staff noticed that there were a number of administrative requirements that would be placed um, on, it, on, on us, which would be, um, needless to say, a little bit challenging to uh, administer under, under current resources. And so um, what we are recommending today um, is that under California Elections Code, uh, the city council may refer this item to staff um, for a, a future report on a number of different items, which are also outlined in the staff report. Um, at a minimum, we are suggesting uh, that the council direct staff to return uh, with this report on June 28th, um, at a minimum with the, with the fiscal impact report, as well as any other items that are listed in the staff report that may be of interest to the council. And so with that, um, I'd be happy to turn it back to you and, and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you so much um, for bringing that forward and bringing some of those questions forward in the recommendation. Um, do any council members have questions at this point on this item, the impact report for this item? Okay. Um, I would, I do see that there are attendees here. And so, um, this is 
now the time I will go to public comment. If you are interested in commenting on um, the recommendation for an impact report for the empty home tax initiative petition, you can raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or choosing the raise hand feature in the webinar controls of your computer. When it's your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and the timer will be set for three minutes. So our first member of the public is the name Amanda. Hi Amanda, go ahead and unmute yourself, press star six. And Amanda is gone. Hi everybody, my oh. name is Amanda. <laughs> thank go you. Ahead. Okay, thank you Sonia. Um, my name is Amanda, I'm a community member and an organizer. I would like to point out the larger picture here of why I'm in total support of the Empty Home Tax Initiative and why it's desperately needed to help our community, community stay a community. This larger picture speaks to the issue around creating fair district maps. We have a PAC in Santa Cruz that has the ability to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to help fund some of the very council members in this meeting right now. At a recent meeting, they discussed how they wanted to support the election of an at-large mayor, and they have also openly discussed and started to organize against the empty home tax, spewing false claims about the initiative. I ask you to all think about our service industry workers, our healthcare workers, teachers, et cetera, that are fighting to just barely make ends meet. How are these groups of people supposed to fight against a group made up of Santa Cruz Seaside Company, local developers and realtors that have the ability to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars in just a few months to fight any efforts made to create any relief. The empty home tax can help support desperately needed affordable housing projects. We do not want falsely inflated administrative costs to keep this measure from passing. There are other current ordinances that have similar administrative structures like the short-term rental program, and I urge you all to find a way to make this work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next member of the public has a phone number ending in 1705. Thank you, Mayor, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Great, uh, thank you. This is Eric Rodberg and I strong, strongly support this ordinance. I do think a impact analysis is very important. And the issue of housing affordability for both renters and buyers is uh, difficult. It's in all of coastal California and Santa Cruz is no exception. The causes are multiple, but one of the causes in Santa Cruz is not empty homes. Anyone who actually lives here and is being honest will know that we have an extremely low vacancy rate. <clears throat> uh, if there were a significant vacancy rate, I would definitely think as something like an empty home tax would be worth considering, but we don't. So what's going to happen if it passes is it's very likely that the cost of administering the program will outweigh the revenues, especially when the uh, ordinance itself limits the administrative expenses to 15% of the revenues, not the administrative expenses, are, are, I'm sorry, they are not limited, but the 15% the of the revenues are limited to pay for the expenses. So the expenses are most likely going to outstrip the revenues that can be used from the tax to pay for the expenses, which means the revenues will have to come out of our already short general fund. Um, <clears throat> the proponents have been touting the census numbers as showing a large vacancy. First of all, the census is not a relevant measure because the census is a point in time count. The in EHT is a year on vacancy. Those are two totally separate numbers. And you can't use a metric for one to measure a metric for something else. It just doesn't work like that. On top of that, this census, the 2020 census was taken during the height of the lockdown when UCSC closed in-person instruction and close to 20,000 students left town. And there were great vacancies during um, the beginning of 2020. So you need to, you can't rely on the census. It's not relevant. And even if it were the 2020 census 
is not accurate. Now, I, I will point out a couple things. One is that there's an ordinance on the books, uh, Santa Cruz Municipal Code or ordinance that prohibits condominium conversions when the vacancy rate is below 5%. That has been in place for decades because we've always had a very low vacancy rate. So I really encourage you to look at, you know, look at this very closely because I think what this measure is doing is it's scapegoating a very tiny number of people who have vacation homes. Um, they're not the cause of our housing problems. In fact, I would say that the proponents of this measure are more of a cause than the very small number of wealthy out-of-towners who have vacation homes on Westcliff. Because the proponents of the measure are the same people who oppose every single housing proposal, even the 100% affordable housing proposals, such as Pacific Station, when they come up. So it's just gonna divert okay. our attention from real solutions. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, our next member of the public is the name Reggie Miser. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, <clears throat> yeah, I am obviously a big supporter of the empty home tax. I helped canvas um, to get this on um, the ballot. And, you know, I, while I think impact analyses are important for something like this, uh, I just wanna voice a bit of concern given the history of city staff engagement with community measures specifically. Back in 2019, I worked with council member Cummings to find uh, to try and develop an ordinance to get us a better understanding of evictions by tracking notices to quit and rent increases after the failure of Measure M to try to figure out how to get some movement forward and to inform policy. Now, what happened was staff took what we were trying to develop and made the data collection voluntary. And so what does that do? It ruins the data by introducing a ton of selection bias. And this is not the only time staff has taken something that was specifically for working people that was coming from the community and sort of tainted it because of backroom conversations with California Apartment Association, Santa Cruz Together, um, basically people who are owners, landlords, uh, realtors, people with money and power in our community. And so I just want to like urge folks to understand that given the history, I'm concerned that this impact report is meant to take public dollars and produce propaganda against empty home tax before it is put on the ballot. And I, it really disturbs me to have to say that because I feel like city staff should not be a biased organization. They're an executive branch, right? Um, so the other thing that I wanna just quickly mention is where was the impact report for the tow yard that like police and city staff just sort of developed on their own, no council approval. I still don't think we know how much that cost. Um, and what was it for? It was exhausting city workers. It was just hurting people to just increase our capacity to tow vehicles away and take people's shelter from them. So where was the impact report? Where was the sort of feeling that this needs to happen? It was not there. And I think that just demonstrates the sort of discrepancy about where, when we care about impact reports in this city and when we don't care. So I'll leave it there. Thank you for your comment. Um, our next member of the public, Cindy Dawson. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, uh, good afternoon council members. My name is Cindy Dawson and I'm the volunteer campaign manager for this community driven people powered empty home tax initiative. As you know, we're in a housing affordability crisis and this seeks to create an annual funding stream, which is something the council talks about and struggles with often about not having funding to do the things we want to do. 
Um, and this would do that for the lowest income levels. And in the Santa Cruz, we know that the lowest income level includes teachers, it includes healthcare workers, childcare workers, and the service workers that drive our tourist economy. So if we wanna keep those people in our community, we need to find a way to build them housing and the empty home tax does that. Um, I'm happy to hear that you're interested in an impact report and I wanna just ensure that it's um, well-researched and balanced. The California Department of Finance just re-released numbers um, showing that we have a 9% vacancy rate. I hear lots of people talk about that this isn't a good number or that isn't a good number. Um, the methodologies were changed by the census in 2020 for the American Community Survey. They actually look at length of, of, of vacancy. So it's not the, the decadal census, it's actually the American Community Survey. And I hope that your staff does the research, really looks into these numbers, and also just take a spin around town. We have lots of homes that are not used for 120 days a year. And we want to provide an, an opportunity for those folks to either live in their house, rent their house, or if they choose to hold it vacant, they can support the biggest need of the community that they were drawn to, which is these lower income units. And that's why affordable housing experts like Housing Santa Cruz County have endorsed the empty home tax. It's straightforward, it makes sense, and it helps. It's not a silver bullet, but it will help. Um, also, as for administering the tax, there are models in place around the world. Um, Vancouver has a model very similar to what would be in this ordinance. It's a self-declaration affidavit. It's an online form. It takes about five minutes for the average homeowner to fill that out every year. Costs can be managed if the city uh, looks around for existing models. We also spoke to staff in these cities and they, they told us, leave some flexibility for the city so that they make sure to keep costs down and integrate to existing systems. We did that in the ordinance so that the city can choose to, to integrate into existing systems. Um, uh, the, you know, the yearly affidavit, again, it can be done online or paper. Um, and, and how much this costs is really dependent on the city. There's no minimum number of audits, for instance. It's just like any other tax. It can be random audits. It will be random audits. And how many of those audits the city does a year is um, administration costs can be managed. Turn in over 6,000 signatures. It would be many more if we had a chance to talk to people. We saw broad support. Your from time is up. Thank you. Like myself. Thanks for your comment. Our next caller has the name Darius Mosinen. Go ahead and unmute. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. Um, it's ironic that the uh, council meeting has been <clears throat> gone all remote because of the uptick in COVID cases because we follow the science. Well, I, I advise you to follow the science <clears throat> on the empty home tax and <laughs> I did just that. Uh, in front of you in your email, you have basically a, a database of all of the housing units in Santa Cruz that have absentee ownership. This is from the assessor, by the way, that are absentee owner, owner uh, owned, not in the rental inspection data, not in the rental inspection database, and not in the short-term rental database. Therefore, they are potential homes owned by absentee owners, um, either not either vacant or rented. There's a total of 575 in your database. <clears throat> I've even organized it by street so people can walk and check for a vacancy or occupancy. <clears throat> I did just that with a couple of folks in, uh, on a rainy February. We sampled 49 of these potential vacant homes, again, based on absentee ownership from the assessor. We found three that were vacant, two that were being remodeled, one that was being prepared for sale. So I challenge, in fact, I invite the EHT folks and I'd love to send this to them and they can help help do the research and actually identify if these are empty. Now let's talk about the other homes. There's 24,500 rental, uh, rental units, uh, excuse me, dwelling units in Santa Cruz. 11,375 are in the rental inspection database, 308 are in the STR, short-term rental, that leaves about 13,000 that are basically owner-occupied. These owner-occupied 
homes have taken the majority have taken the homestead exemption, which saves them seventy dollars a year under penalty uh, in property tax under penalty of perjury. They've told the assessor, "Yes, this is my primary residence." So why would we snow them annually with affidavits saying, "Are you still there? Are you still there? Do you still live there? Do you still have primary residence?" When they've told the assessor, I mean, it's harassment of homeowners. It's a huge waste of resources, uh, uh, administrative time, of which by the time you do the research on those 575 homes in front of you in a database, I will, in fact, you have this in writing or on, on record, I will contribute $10,000 to the EHT campaign to cover their, uh, cover their expenses if 50, more than 50, rental home, 50 vacant homes are found. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your comment. Uh, our next member of the public has the name, I am watching you. Yes, hello. I have no idea why Member Brown isn't recusing herself from this item since her name seems to appear as a signatory to the out of council initiative measure. I have no desire to report on my personal property use to this communist BSA inspired measure. It's another pick on someone else, anybody else, hijack the government to strongman somebody and force people to rent property because somebody doesn't have what somebody else has. What the city is, is what the city is. What it becomes is what it becomes, but private property cannot be continually coming under attack as a result of these uh, socialist communist ideas. Hey, communist DSAers, it's not your house. Go buy one and you can rent it out as much as you want. Is a two home owner, uh, owner any different than somebody that owns a mansion on a large lot? Not really, but this measure says it is. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense for me. And it's just like, it's like another reason to move out of here. I mean, really, I mean, if I didn't have certain people I care about, I'd be gone a long time ago. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is Katie Spencer. Um, yeah, my name is Katie Spencer. I'm a community member who has rented in Santa Cruz for the last five years now. Um, I saw that the empty home tax was on the agenda today, so I wanted to make time to call in and voice my strong support for this initiative. Um, the empty home tax just makes sense in our city, which has both a very high vacancy rate, as Cindy mentioned, like so many coastal California cities, but also uniquely tops the list as one of the most unaffordable places to live in the entire country. Um, we so often are told the funds don't exist to create low and very low income affordable housing. And as a result, we see a lot of units built that are marketed as affordable, but are unattainable if you're making our city's average income. And the empty home tax is not the only solution for this affordability crisis. It doesn't pretend to be, but it also feels important to note that it isn't that radical of an idea. Similar vacancy taxes have been implemented with success in other cities like Vancouver, British Columbia. And relevant to this discussion, uh, Santa Cruz's empty home tax initiative follows Vancouver's lead and caps admin costs at a certain level. So there are protections baked into this initiative that limit admin costs. I very much support this initiative. I hope that this impact report is done fairly. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. The next name is Jasmine Mia. Go ahead and unmute. Welcome. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. There we go. Sorry about that. Anyways, um, I'm Jasmine Mia, and I'm calling in in support of the empty home tax because um, I, I hear people's concerns about, you know, it's private property. How can we dictate what they do with it? But we have to remember that the empty home tax is a way to try to chip away at the problems of our housing crisis. And I think it's fair to preclude vacant houses given our out of control housing crisis in Santa Cruz. So many people are not able to afford housing who work here, who are part of our community. We're trying to take away the rights of people to live in their vehicles and camp. And so where are people supposed to go? What are they supposed to do? And I think, you know, it's given the crisis that this is so warranted. And I would hope people would tap into their humanity and realize if they have a house sitting there that they're not using for more than, you know, 100, that they're not even in for 120 days. I mean, that should totally go to someone who needs housing. Also, I agree with um, the public comment of Reggie Meisler 
um, because I saw that go down. You know, I'm, I'm his wife and I saw him fight for that data collection and how city staff just totally tainted the whole process because, you know, taking statistics, all sorts of things. Like, I know that if you make something voluntarily reporting, there's a selection bias. You're not gonna get all the data of all the actual evictions and tracking. So we wouldn't get the correct data anyways. And um, and so I do think and worry that city, city staff is working with um, potentially backroom deals with uh, realtor associations. And so I don't know if I would trust their impact report um, at this point. And so, you know, as people have stressed, I would hope that's a fair impact report. And um, yeah, but I support empty home tax and yeah, want this to be a fair process and for people to have like, and you know, real information so they can make an informed decision for the ballot as it should be. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, is there anyone who has not had a chance to speak for public comment? At this time, I will bring it back then to council for comments, action, and deliberation, discussion. Um, and just for those of the public tuning in, um, this item is a recommendation from um, our finance staff for an impact report, not whether or not we will decide on the empty home tax, but an impact report if the empty home tax proceeds forward, how will that impact the city and in what ways? And in our agenda report, there were eight, I believe eight um, bullet points that were listed. And um, if there are any others, I know that one of the callers did bring up the homestead declaration um, as something to look at. So I'd like to um, see if any council members would like to ask any questions, have any discussion. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so for the sake of full disclosure, for those who may not be familiar, since it was mentioned by a member of the public, I am a signer on the initial petition um, to, the, and the, to circulate the initiative. And um, we did uh, garner the requisite number of signatures to put this on the ballot. Um, I so just so everyone's clear, I I did that as uh, an alternative to um, because I was not able to get that on our city council agenda to, for the council to place it on uh, the ballot. So um, yes, that is true. And um, <laughs> with that full disclosure, I'd like to ask the city attorney to uh, respond to the question about my uh, ability under the Brown Act and any other potential. Um, rules about whether or not I should be uh, weighing in or voting on this item. Uh, yeah, thank you, Councilmember Brown. I'm happy to respond to that question. Um, we looked into that issue uh, under the Political Reform Act and um, <clears throat> also under common law uh, conflict of interest rules and concluded that there's no uh, disqualifying conflict of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. And so if I, just a follow up question, I am not seeing a lot of hands go up here. So I want to try to move us along. Um, I do think it's important to uh, try to uh, get additional information. And I'm glad we're now in a position to be able to get some of that additional analysis from the city, which we didn't have access to during the signature gathering phase. And um, so I, I'm just in terms of uh, Director McGee, you said that you'd like to have us move a recommendation to bring back an impartial analysis. Um, and I'm I'm prepared to go ahead and do that um, right now. So I would Great. make that motion. We have a motion by Council Member Brown to move the recommended uh, motion to order an impact report pursuant to California Elections Code Section 9212 related to the empty home tax initiative petition 
with the report to come to council at the June 28th, 2022 meeting. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, we have a second by council vice mayor Watkins. Is there further discussion? Council member Cummings. Thank you, mayor. And um, yeah, I think that related to the comments we heard, I just, um, you know, hope that we can ensure that this is a transparent, non-biased process that we're about to engage in. Um, I think that there is some concern from the community on um, the types of reports that have been created in the past, and there's just concern um, about, you know, the potential for bias. And so to the extent that we can um, also report out on the methodology behind the process so that the community is clear on how the process took place. I think that will help the community better understand and see <clears throat> what sources of information we're using, um, you know, how we came up with the, the plan and and really used and, um, and demonstrate the, the, the methods that we're using so we can make it clear that it's an unbiased approach. Thank you, council member Cummings. Um, I will add, um, um, as one one member of the public commented to make sure that it's well balanced and researched um, and um, to really look at you know how we can integrate into the systems that exist. And so having all of those options, you know the, the eight bullet points outlined um, as you know in our agenda packet, I think it's really important to, document and and show all of those various impacts. Thank you. All right, well, we have a motion uh, and looks like we can go to a roll call vote. Council Good members, Kellen Perry Johnson. Aye. Holder. Aye. Coming. Aye. Brown. Aye. Councilmember Myers. Absent. Um, Vice Mayor Watkins. Aye. And Mayor Bruner. Aye. That motion passes six in favor, one absent. Okay. Our next agenda item is number 22. And this is a impact report of effect for our downtown, our future initiative petition. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff or council members followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and return to council for deliberation and action. In addition to public comment, we will be hearing on this item, nine emails were sent to city council regarding this um, item. And so um, I'd like to um, present Let's see, Council Member Kalantari Johnson and uh, Council Member Myers, if you're present. Uh, I think Council Member Myers logged off, um, so I'm happy to speak to it and, uh, and I'll keep it brief. The agenda report um, uh, outlines the reason for this uh, impact report. There was extensive public process, of course, on the mixed use affordable housing project, which this initiative will impact. And, um, you know, similar to the last um, item that we just heard, we want to make sure that we have an impartial review of the potential impacts of this proposal. So um, with that, I'll, I'll pass it to um, Matt or Lee or Bonnie if they want to add anything. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, City Manager Matt Heffaker. No, thank you, Mayor. I think Council Member Kalantari Johnson covered it well. This is an opportunity for us to 
really um, review a range of potential impacts associated with the, the on off um, initiative uh, that was brought forward. We do anticipate that that will likely come to the council for certification in late June, which would give us um, approximately no more than 30 days to complete that study, which will be brought back to the to the council as part of a special meeting in late July. So that's the rough time frame. Uh, happy to answer any questions that the council may have otherwise. Okay, thank you. Do council members have any questions on this impact report for this item? Okay. I will look out to members of the public for public comment. Now is the time to raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or select raise hand on the webinar controls of your computer. When it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will be set to three minutes. And our first member of the public has the name Alyssa Kroger. Good afternoon, can you all hear me? Yes, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Brenner and City Council members. Alyssa Kroger, Housing Program Manager with Monterey Bay Economics Partnership. Calling in today to express our strong support for a request to prepare an impact study of the Our Downtown, Our Future ballot initiative and require an accurate depiction of the facts framing the issues put forth by the initiative if it qualifies. Our housing initiative supports projects that reflect high quality design, higher density housing serving all income levels and in appropriate locations near jobs and other amenities. Projects like the Downtown Library Affordable Housing Project. ODLF's initiative, if passed, would terminate the proposed Downtown Library Affordable Housing Project, along with the difficult to secure grant funding associated with this project, effectively halting 125 affordable units already in the pipeline that would assist the city in reaching its increased six cycle arena targets of 3,736 new units by 2030 and would keep a green space, modern library with resources for all, a childcare facility and a parking component that includes up to 315 public spaces, none of which are intended for the proposed affordable housing units and which consolidates current surface parking lots, resulting in an overall decrease in parking spaces in downtown Santa Cruz from benefiting the greater community. It is paramount, especially in the face of our local housing affordability crisis, that a thoughtful analysis of the ODOS initiatives impacts be thoroughly studied and presented to the public to address any potential for misinformation and encourage informed decision making at the polls. Thank you for your leadership in addressing the potential impacts of this far reaching affordable housing issue as it relates to the ODOF ballot initiative. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is Kyle Kelly. Now, Mayor Bruner and Council members, this is Kyle Kelly. Uh, I'm in support of conducting a study on the effect of the Our Downtown, Our Future initiative. Uh, I'm in full support of the expanded library space, affordable housing, child care, and public open space that come together to form the library mixed use project. Um, additionally, I do support a permanent home for the farmer's market on lot seven. I'm ready to bike, walk, and roll to the new farmer's lo market location. I welcome neighbors to their new homes above the library. As a supporter of the library mixed use project that I was watched to become a better and better project through years of community input, I would like to have the honest truth about a measure that allocates zero funding while throwing away years of work and advocacy. As part of the study, I ask that you determine how much additional time families will have to wait for their chance to live in affordable apartments downtown if this measure were to pass. This should include how many evictions, increases in rent, and the overall exacerbation of homelessness will be expected if these 100 plus homes are stopped. And housing advocates know that if the library mixed use project is stopped, it will affect not just the 100 plus families that move into their new homes. The people that move out are making room for someone else to move in, right? You're looking at not just those 100 families, but everybody else is able to basically move into new housing as, as, as people move into affordable housing, right? Stopping the library housing project now is telling hundreds or even thousands of families to wait their turn. Please support conducting the study and reaffirm your support for building housing, a library, and childcare now on lot four. 
Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is Reggie Meiser. Welcome. Hi, uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to um, sort of note how interesting it is that we have Yimby supporters coming on to comment on this ordinance, but not on the empty home tax, which they supposedly endorsed uh, just recently. Um, I find it really disingenuous for the Santa Cruz Yimby group to endorse ordinances that they put no actual energy or support behind and then kind of, you know, endorse candidates for district three supervisor race, let's say that are against said ordinances. So I just wanted to sort of bring out that sort of discrepancy to the public about what Santa Cruz EMB says they support and what they actually do. Thank you. Okay, that looks like that concludes our public comment. At this time, I will bring it back to council and our agenda. Um, and does anyone want to make a motion? We can further discussion. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. I see Council Member Kalantari Johnson who brought this item forward. Are you interested in making the motion? If so, I'm happy to second. Sure, I'd like to make the motion. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. No okay, problem. we have a motion by Council Member Kalantari Johnson and a second by Vice Mayor Watkins. Okay, and now a discussion. Uh, I, City Clerk Bonnie Bush. Thank you. I just want to confirm um, because the agenda report, as we brought forward, had a, a date of June 28th for the report back. I just want to confirm. Yes. Making that a little bit later. Uh, we need to make it later. Yeah, we could. Yes. Uh, Sorry, Mayor and Council, and perhaps uh, Councilmember Calantari uh, Johnson might want to make a tweak to the motion, but uh, we would ask for um, time to develop that study to bring it back no later than July 28th, which would be approximately 30 days from the Council's expected certification of the petition. Does the maker of the motion want to amend that date in the recommendation? Sure. Would you like me to read the motion? I realize I didn't do that. Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, motion to order an impact report pursuant to California Election Code Section 9212 and as described herein related to our Downtown Our Future initiative petition with a report to come to Council no later than July 28th, 2022. Okay, and is the seconder okay with that? Okay. Uh, City Attorney, did you have any comment? No, okay. Um, okay, thank you. So we have that motion on the table. Um, Council Member uh, Brown and then Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to say that I, I also support moving forward with this uh, analysis and in, in the spirit of ensuring that it is an impartial analysis, I would hope as we discussed with the previous uh, item that um, members of the community and in, in particular uh, representatives of the Our Downtown, Our Future campaign be consulted in that process. Um, you know, I unfortunately, because we in our community have we have trouble and, and I, I don't think this is particular to Santa Cruz um, but as we engage in in politics um, having conversations with each other and it often feels like um, you know people feel like their voices aren't being heard um, this is I think part of the the challenge that we face and part of the reason we are here today with this initiative coming forward um, and uh, so I would like to make, um, I'll, I'll attempt to make a friendly amendment here to um, <laughs> ask that uh, the consultants, you know, in the spirit of impartial analysis include um, our downtown, our future representatives in 
the conversation as part of their analysis. I'm happy to uh, include that as a friendly amendment. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we in the seconder of the motion. Great. So we have a friendly amendment to in include in the spirit of impartial analysis, the consultants of our downtown, our future. Okay. City clerk, did you get that? I did, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, um, I just wanna express um, my support as well for the impact report. Um, I mean, it's it's pretty clear that there's going to be some financial impacts if we deviate from the direction we've been heading just because we've been spending money on um, you know, architects coming up with designs. And so, you know, if we shifted away from this right now, it's, it's clear that there's going to be financial impacts. Um, so I guess, you know, and I guess that actually leads me to a question. Is part of this analysis going to really look at, you know, the overall should the measure pass the overall impacts on all the different pieces of the ordinance or is this specifically focusing on um, the library? Mayor, I, I, can attempt to re I can attempt to respond to that real briefly. I appreciate the, the question, Council Member Cummings. Uh, you'll note in the staff report that we included um, a detailed range of potential impacts associated with the various proposals set forth uh, in the initiative. So the, the hope here is we can get a full comprehensive understanding of the potential impacts related to the proposal, both financial, but land use, as well as um, the project uh, as well, um, how the project stacks up with uh, remaining in its current location uh, versus the, the current path that we are um, headed down. Um, in addition to implications it could have on the farmer's market, as well as um, housing generation in the downtown and, and overall downtown economic development as well. So we tried to uh, put together a fairly robust um, set of impacts to be studied, um, acknowledging that this is a fairly complex uh, proposal and wanting the council and the community to have the benefit of, of understanding what the potential impacts would be. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear to the community because there's a lot of potential um, impacts and, you know, I think it'll be good for us to see what those will be. And I know for some community members, it's going to be at a shock and they're going to be opposed to it. And for some community members, they might actually want to, you know, they, they might think it's a, a good use of tax dollars. So, <clears throat> um, so yeah, again, just hoping that we can have a very impartial um, and unbiased process and just encourage us to have that process clearly laid out um, along with who was engaged with, how many meetings were had, the, how the analysis came about, just so that um, we're reducing the potential for um, for bias and also so that we are being transparent, most importantly, with the community on how this process uh, was carried out. Great, thank you. Uh, is there any further council member Comments or discussion? If not, we'll move to a roll call vote on this item. Okay, uh, City Clerk, we can have a roll call vote, please. Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Aye. Coming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Uh, Councilmember Myers. So absent. Um, Vice Mayor Watkins. Aye. And Mayor Berner. Aye. That motion passes six in favor, one absent. Councilmember Myers. Thank you. Um, okay, so at this time, we will recess for a, a food break, dinner break, and we will return at 515 for oral communications and um, our budget hearing.
presentations. So I will see everybody at 515. Thank you. Oh, Council Member Brown. Mayor Bruner, I'm, I'm just wondering, is it possible, I know we have budget hearings tonight and tomorrow, um, what departments will be up this evening or will we do, be doing an overview? I'm just trying to get a sense of where to focus my next hour um, in our big binder. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, city manager Matt Hefferker, I believe it's library and water. Right, so this afternoon, uh, thanks for the question, Councilmember Brown. We plan on starting off with a budget overview that will be followed by uh, library, finance, human resources, information technology, <laughs> and water. Uh, which will then be followed by an opportunity for public input. That's what we're hoping to cover in our afternoon session. Thank you. And we will continue our meeting. Welcome back. Okay. Is the city clerk ready? I am, thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right, good evening. Welcome to our 5.15 p.m. session of the May 24th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, May. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Kalantari Johnson. Present. Boulder. Present. Cummings. Council member Cummings is currently absent. Brown? Here. Council member Myers is absent. Okay. Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. And Mayor Bruner? Present. Thank you. This part of our agenda is oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you wish to comment, 
during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions should be on your screen. <clears throat> oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls of your computer. You will have three minutes to speak. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public in this format. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has completed. I will now go out to our attendees and look for any hands raised. And I see a hand ending, phone number ending in 1999. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Welcome. Good evening, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Uh, let's see, just what's coming next. I just wrote something and read it back to myself. I'm just gonna say it. In October 2024, a cosmological alignment not experienced since 79 day AD is stated to be happening, i.e. a mud flood. Fast changing the subject, vast amounts of study in regards to the sun nova clock cycle based upon thousands of core samples around planet Earth where in just the last 200,000 years, an average has been made of 12,068 years. This is a naturally occurring ice age. The last one, 12,500 years ago, was the Younger Dryas. This ice age doesn't occur in months. It's some people, you know, it could occur in, in hours. Imagine 1,000 feet of ocean evaporating. That will cause an ice age. But, 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 we have world famous, oh, I use the word idiots, that are sharing that carbon dioxide is an issue where in fact, 400 parts per million, which is what we're currently at now, is the lowest it's been in 2 million years. So what makes planet Earth healthy? It's carbon dioxide. Now I'm just gonna go through some other stuff. Um, you know, there are a great deal of carbon that's being used. It's being used to track our food. It's called graphene oxide. It's one of the adjuvants that's in these vaccines. Now, you guys are, are being cautious but are you really being as logical as you could be? Let's use the example of if the cornholio virus was really so deadly, why haven't all the homeless people died in the past two and a half years? I think that you guys would, uh, would market that as well. So I have a lot of questions going on and it seems like for whatever reason, what Steiner wrote about the soul of man was gonna be removed through vaccines is happening vaccines and frequencies he wrote that in two in 1917 so i have a lot of compassion for the things that i keep hearing um but i find it kind of annoying can i be told how much time i have left i forgot my timer 45 i don't even seconds. know if i'm still on the phone 45 okay. seconds okay 39 seconds you know what i have a lot of questions i am reminded of the beautiful conversation i had with Police Chief Andy Mills on January 24th, 2020, where after like a 30 minute one on one conversation, I looked out his window of his office and I said, you know, I was going to rent a garage there, but I don't think that's the best part of town. But wow, what a bunch of chemtrails today. And he said, you know, I'm not worried about that. There's a lot of things that could be talked about that jurisdictions like this are not talking about. Thank you very much. Okay, our next member of the public for oral communications is the name Brian Shields. Hi there, welcome. Hello, and uh, thank you for thank you for spending your time tonight. Mm -hmm. um, good evening, Mayor and Council members. My name is Brian Shields. I'm an organizer for Carpenters Local 505 that covers Santa Cruz. Tonight, I want to speak to you about the need for labor standards standards that would secure the working class's place here in Santa Cruz as everything continues to increase in price as we know. Apprenticeship, healthcare, local hire, and a livable wage should be the template developers need to approach Santa Cruz by. 
I would like to express to you that without such standards, the construction force is systematically abused through wage theft, 1099, where workers have no workers' compensation when hurt on the job, and a litany of safety violations. The language that should become policy here in Santa Cruz would support responsible contractors that are already doing the right thing by their clients, environments, and employees. These responsible contractors have proven time after time that they can perform to the highest standards. The policy would bolster the working class and cultivate responsible markets for good contractors. This would be the creation of a floor, a minimum bar set for developers that are coming into Santa Cruz, saying value our citizens as you build on our land. I would very much like to have a real conversation, a valued conversation with each and every one of you to answer questions that you might have about labor violations that I have seen and what the standards might look like. Before I go, let me leave you with this question. How can you as city council members better support and guard the working women and men of beautiful Santa Cruz? And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Our next member of the public for oral communications is phone number ending in 8157. Press star six to unmute yourself. Good evening, my name is John Hall. I'm the co-chair of Our Downtown, Our Future. I'm not sure whether the consent agenda item number 22 uh, was pulled to be discussed. Uh, if it was, I would uh, wait until it comes onto the agenda to talk. Otherwise, I, I'd like to speak now. This is for any uh, oral communications for anything not on today's agenda. All right, but I, I guess my question is, has item 22 been discussed or not? We are currently on item oral communications and then going into item 23. I see, so you've already talked about item uh, 22, the Ode of uh, Our Downtown, Our Future Consultant. That item has passed. Okay. All right. Well, I would uh, still like, a, a, I can't comment on it except in public comment, given it was on the consent agenda. So I'd just like to say that uh, Our Downtown, Our Future would look forward to working with the city uh, within its planning framework uh, as it's implemented if our measure passes. Uh, we do endorse the motion for a consultant to conduct an impact assessment of our downtown and our futures measure, and we encourage the city to search for a consultant of the highest competence and one that can provide a completely objective and unbiased analysis. As a policy analyst will know, analyses concerning future events and their impacts have to be based on information that can never be complete or absolute. Uh, given unknown developments and unanticipated events. We therefore urge that the consultant be tasked with reporting its range of confidence in its analytic conclusions, as well as the degree of certainty concerning uh, predicted events. And finally, I'd like to raise the issue of scoping. Both our downtown, our futures measure and the lot four mixed use library parking structure housing proposal contain potential costs and potential benefits. Uh, each alternative thus should be analyzed in these terms. As the staff report indicates, the consultant's analysis needs to incorporate comparison, not only to the status quo, but to the present plans for downtown. So we anticipate that a thorough consultant's report would include analyses of a number of issues that we have identified in our letter that I submitted to the city council and the mayor yesterday. I would appreciate it if you would uh, attend to that and forward those requests for the report to include those analyses for the public's benefit as well. And we look forward to uh, working with and hope that uh, both the consultant and city staff will consult with our downtown, our future during the period of the consultant's work on its report. Thanks very much to all of you. Uh, we appreciate your time. 
Okay, our next member of the public, um, and this is oral communications. Um, and then we will have item 23 on our agenda after oral communications. So oral communications is a time to comment on anything that is not on today's agenda. Rob Darrow is Santa Cruz Pride. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Bruner and members of the City Council. First, I wanna thank you for the proclamation declaring June 2022 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month. Hopefully I'll get a copy of that and I can put it on our website. Um, as you may or may not know, the first Santa Cruz Pride event in Santa Cruz County was in 1975, the third such event in the state of California after San Francisco and Los Angeles. That year, the Santa Cruz Pride organizers organized the first Gay Pride Week in June of that year. Most of those activities were in San Lorenzo Park. I'm here today to invite you to be part of Santa Cruz Pride and the Santa Cruz Pride Parade this year, which will be on June 5th in downtown Santa Cruz. In particular, if you'd like to be in the parade, please let anybody uh, let me know and I'll make sure that you can be included in the parade. Um, in addition, I, I wanna just commend the City Parks and Recreation Department for guiding us in the organization and the permitting of the Pride Parade and Festival. They have been helpful in our planning and quick to respond. Um, finally, in 2025 will be our 50th anniversary of Santa Cruz Pride and we look forward to working with the future council members to make that 50th anniversary a big celebration across the county. Um, more than anything, I wanna thank all of you for the work you do to make the city of Santa Cruz one of the most inclusive cities for LGBTQ plus people in the nation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public is Marie Bunch. Impress. Hello, City Council members. My name is Marie Bunch. I'm a seventh grader from Tierra Pacifica Charter Schools and a youth representative of Friday Night Live Santa Cruz City Schools chapter. Tonight, I would like to share with you our project that's focused on tobacco waste, as well as my personal experience and perspective of how tobacco waste affects our community. I've lived in Santa Cruz my whole life and seeing trash and especially cigarette litter in not just my community, but the larger Santa Cruz County has made me disappointed and frustrated. Over 4.5 trillion cigarette butts are littered worldwide, but are also the number one littered item found on California roads and our beautiful beaches. In March of this year, five FNL youth collected over 1,000 cigarette butts around downtown Santa Cruz and over 300 butts around the beach boardwalk in just one hour, even though smoking is illegal in both of these locations. It's amazing how large these numbers are. It makes me think about the impact on fish and other marine animals, because cigarette waste is not only disgusting to look at, but also has a huge impact on the animals living here and human health. Cigarettes contain things like arsenic, hydrogen cyanide, sulfuric acid, tar, and many more incredibly harmful chemicals. When cigarettes are littered, these chemicals make their way into our waterways, soil, and oceans, harming our plants and ecosystems. Santa Cruz is such a beautiful place with so much wildlife and it's home to many different animal habitats. Seeing all of that harm by cigarette litter makes me inspired to advocate for policy change to make a turn for the better. As I expected, other people care about this issue as well. I've been able to go to events like the Seymour Center Earth Day event to share our concerns and the community response has been overwhelmingly positive. We've collected over 64 signatures from residents of the city that agree that they support a policy solution to mitigate the impacts of tobacco waste in the city of Santa Cruz. FNL Youth want to thank you for recognizing tobacco waste as a public health environmental threat and for your commitment to prioritize it in an upcoming agenda. We ask that you continue to prioritize next steps to identify a policy solution that will mitigate the impact of tobacco waste in the city of Santa Cruz and keep our community and wildlife safe. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public is Nico Marinovic. Hi, um, I'm a FNL youth representative, like the person before me, and I'm here to give a little speech on my uh, the project that we just did. Um, this year, the Santa Cruz City Schools Friday Night Live FNL chapter has taken a specific interest in tobacco waste. We dedicated our time to understanding the impacts of tobacco waste, designing a project to educate our peers and community on this issue, and are passionate about reducing tobacco waste in the city of Santa Cruz. We wish to commend you for your 
uh, council resolution in April of 2021 recognizing tobacco waste as a public health and environmental threat to the people of the city. And we recently unanimously voted to put tobacco waste on the agenda in an upcoming city council meeting, no later than August. We thank you for your leadership. We support you in these efforts and we look forward to the adoption of policy as a best practice solution to addressing tobacco waste. Through our research, we have learned that tobacco waste is the serious public health and environmental justice issue. Cigarette butts are the number one littered item on the planet. This has been the case for the last 35 years. Furthermore, they are the number one littered item on California roads and our beautiful beaches that are special to our county. Over 2.5 million adults in CA, or in California, smoke cigarettes in 2019, which is roughly 10% of the population. Over 40,000 adults die of tobacco related illnesses every year, but that's not all. In 2019, 37% of all US high school students reported using some kind of tobacco product. The city council has shown its commitment to creating a community where young people can thrive in a healthy environment. We ask you to continue prioritizing and protecting youth in our natural environment from toxic waste produced by tobacco products as you take action on this important health issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next member of the public is I am watching you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am perplexed considering the wad of Mula Jacola per homeless individual being committed to a new welfare program lately that I would be surprised if better, even if small private sector capitalist innovative partnership solutions couldn't exist. Why um, do only the so-called nonprofit homeless industrial complexes and the government get to blow all this money mostly on themselves? For starters, the cost per person to supervise, house, and feed one person at the armory, I calculated is at least $26.30 a month. While I can't say I personally would be interested in renting and providing for a few subsidized homeless people, let's say in a backyard, backyard ADU I could afford to build because my girlfriend would disown and dismember me. But if my situation was different or in general, a suitable potential AU property was under a five-year rental contract when built to the city to rent to the benefit of two or three homeless individuals, at anything like those per person armory rates, two people for a year being 64,000, three people being 96,000. I have to believe there are select investor landlord providers that would be, oh yeah, very interested, even if it meant some supervision, stocking food and paying utilities. It could also be Cadillac housing, not sleeping on the floor at the same price as the army, including a mailing address, food, showers, bathroom, heat, and perhaps laundry. Try a pilot program and see what happens. Offer it only to landlord investors willing to build a new ADU and participate for five years to spur building more housing. The agreement could be tricky, needs definitions, not for everyone, but there's nothing quite big cashola to spur new housing investment and house homeless at the same time as those money gushing rates. I would guess there are landlord investors who would take even less than armory rates of housing three people. The city would be responsible to fill the vacancies, the landlord reports, vac uh, reports vacancies, the, the city responsible to replace problem tenants. The entire contract is between the city and the landlord with ample landlord protections and insurance. I doubt we'd run out of homeless candidates. If such a rental market existed, it could spur and target new ADU construction, considering the ADU would be paid off in dang short order as a great investment. Yes, I suppose such a program could be problematic with drug addicts, thieves, mentally ill, aggressive types, and those who don't respect private property. But considering uh, there do exist promising homeless people who would respect what a great opportunity it is for them, and the city would be obligated to send them back to the shelters and streets if they cause problems, eventually some people would behave most agreeably. That's not everyone, but I'm not talking about housing just anyone or everyone this way. This special housing benefit would be for promising individuals and that would have time limits. So they would know this is their one valuable chance in time to achieve personal independence, so don't blow it. Landlords pay taxes, unlike nonprofits, and they do like the cash use also. The money you would spend is the same as now that accomplishes less. Thanks. Thank you. It looks like that concludes our oral communications. Um, I'm just making sure there's no other attendees with their hands raised. I will bring it back to our meeting. And before we begin with item number 23, I just 
I know that um, news reports are coming in and I wanted to take a moment of silence. Um, there was a elementary school shooting in Texas and it looks like 14 students and a teacher. Um, I don't know if anyone has any other updates, but it's just so tragic. And um, I just thought we could take a moment to just take a moment of silence for them. Thank you. Okay, now we begin item number 23 on our agenda. This is the fiscal year 2023 proposed budget. This is part one of the city's annual budget presentations. We will receive part two presentations or we will receive some presentations today um, from some departments and we'll continue and resume tomorrow, part two, 9 a.m. Um, for the remaining department presentations. At the end of today's presentations, I will call for public comment on the departments that have presented today. I will now call on city manager, Matt Huffaker, to get us started. Thank you, Mayor Bruner and council. It's good to be here this evening. I'm gonna be tag teaming our kickoff of our budget hearings with interim finance director, Bobby McGee, who's gonna be pulling the presentation here up shortly. All right, can everyone see the screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, very good. Well, again, I wanted to just start off by saying I'm pleased to kick off uh, the fiscal year 2023 proposed budget. Next slide. Our agenda for the evening will include an introduction and overall outlook uh, that will be followed by a fiscal summary from Bobby based on our current fiscal outlook. And then, of course, that will be followed by a series of department budget briefings as we move through this evening and our discussions tomorrow. Next slide. As we get started, oh, you can go back one, Bobby. One ahead of you. As we get started, I wanted to thank Bobby McGee, Lupita Alamos, and our whole finance team, along with all of our departments who have contributed to the proposed budget that you will hear more about today. These continue to be challenging and unprecedented times in the proposed budget, like the last two budgets, required making sacrifices. Uh, with departments across the city contributing to budget reductions as part of our ongoing focus to achieve long-term fiscal sus sustainability for the city. I know these decisions have not been easy and I wanna thank all of our departments and our employees for rolling up their sleeves and helping to achieve a proposed balanced budget for the next 12 months ahead. I know a significant am amount of work led to the proposed budgets that we will be presenting this evening. Next slide. As we look to the year ahead, I also think it's important to reflect on how we got to where we are today, uh, the many challenges that we've navigated together as a community and the organization. Um, these times continue to be challenging and it uh, has obviously been quite the journey and I wanted to, to run through a number of um, the challenges that we have faced and responded to over the last nearly two and a half years of the COVID-19 pandemic. That includes uh, the the pandemic itself, along with the CZU Lightning Complex fire, which had significant ripple effects across our county, including our community. Uh, there was also the significant shock to the local economy uh, from tourism, business closures, uh, the university abruptly closing down and, and being slow to, to really come back to life, and all the residual effects that that has on our downtown and our local economy as our businesses struggle to keep their doors open. Of course, the pandemic has also worsened and really exacerbated um, our homeless crisis and um, housing avail availability and scarcity. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenge that we have seen really 
reach unprecedented levels, not just in Santa Cruz, but across the state of California. And of course, Santa Cruz is not immune to those impacts. We faced two fiscal years of revenue losses, um, really uh, a large piece of the way in which we've been struggling to keep our revenues and expenditures balanced, um, which has resulted in a reliance on uh, reserves, one-time money, and budget solutions to keep uh, bridging that gap, uh, which has proven to be increasingly difficult as we move into um, this budget cycle and uh, budget cycles to come. And again, just a shout out to our employees and the tremendous resiliency that this challenging period has required and the many contributions over the last two years to keep the organization running, to keep our budgets balanced. Um, it has not been an easy time uh, to work in local government uh, and to keep budgets um, afloat. Next slide. In the face of these many challenges, our organization was quick to respond on a multitude of fronts. We declared a fiscal emergency in early 2020, and for the past nearly two and a half years have continued to adapt and respond to the changing community needs and unexpected new challenges that have come with it. That focus and to prioritize our work, a comprehensive re Santa Cruz work plan was developed to ensure that we're investing our time and our resources and the right things as we help our community recover. An ad hoc revenue committee was established to help explore and identify new revenue streams to get us on more stable financial footing. And in fact, the, the measure F uh, half cent sales tax that's on the June ballot is a, is a, a byproduct of that important work um, that staff has been um, exploring alongside uh, the council subcommittee. And I wanna thank them for their time and leadership on, on that front. Uh, we have our fingers crossed for June and that the community will be supportive of this very important additional revenue stream. And in the meantime, we have been fortunate to receive one-time state and federal funding to help our organization stay afloat, invest in recovery efforts, and develop more sustainable approaches to homelessness response. Next slide. So what's next? As we look ahead, we are framing the 2023 budget through the lenses of recover, rebuild, and refocus. Uh, we've overcome significant challenges and we have tremendous opportunities ahead of us. You'll hear from Bobby and our budget team this afternoon uh, that we are continuing to see uh, encouraging signs of economic recovery as major revenue streams reach pre-pandemic levels. Of course, many of those gains are also being offset by some storm clouds on the horizon when it comes to the direction our overall economy is heading, uh, risks of a recession, and of course, the ongoing uh, challenges of in increased inflation as well as uh, Federal Reserve increased interest rates. We'll talk more about that um, as we dive into the fiscal summary, and Bobby has more details on that front as well. Um, and we're continuing to prioritize our employees, uh, fill vacant positions, build back areas of the organization that were hardest hit uh, through the pandemic, as well as bolstering our homelessness response capacity in an effort to increase our effectiveness and alleviate the burden on our operating departments uh, as we focus on rebuilding. And then lastly, our re refocus, um, refocusing our work through the development and intentional work plans that align with the council's priorities. Um, all of this work has helped to inform the proposed budget that you'll hear about this, this evening and as we move forward into the year ahead. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to, to Bobby McGee, who's gonna run us through the rest of the presentation before we jump into our department presentations. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Huffaker. Um, I would like to echo his comments and, and acknowledge the this financial um, department budget team who uh, put in some very long and very stressful hours in order to um, prepare for today's budget hearings today and tomorrow's budget hearings. So thank you to the entire team. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about economic trends. As, uh, as you already heard, we are monitoring a number of things. Um, and of course, inflation is a hot topic right now. Um, we have noticed that uh, inflation in the month of April was actually down a little bit. However, um, that is not in line uh, with what the overall inflationary trends have been for the year. And we are continuing to monitor that um, as we've looked at uh, some of the high fuel prices 
that you'll see down there. I know that um, we've we've looked at oil futures and we are expecting inflation to continue well into the summer um, based on some of the data that we have seen so far. Um, there's a number of other things that you'll see on this slide that we are continuing to monitor as far as macroeconomic trends. Uh, the general fund revenue trends, as the council has heard me say multiple times, the recovery, uh, the, the revenue recovery this year has been stronger than expected. Um, and so although we have, uh, we are approaching overall pre-pandemic uh, general fund revenues, I do want to caution that this is not adjusted for inflation. And so while we've seen the, the hard number of actual revenue um, come back, what we have not seen is, is our purchasing power that we enjoyed previously um, before the pandemic. So uh, major expenditures that, uh, that we're looking at here in fiscal year 23, um, there were, have been a significant increase in liability and property insurance costs. Um, that is not indigenous to this city. Uh, I've talked to finance directors all over the state that have said um, they're seeing some of the same types of um, activities um, as far as uh, uh, risk management um, costs. Um, the, the budget includes $5 million in capital projects for this year. As we've discussed a number of times, $5 million barely scratches the surface when uh, considering the city's overall unfunded capital needs. Um, an ERP system is going to be required to be replaced in the near future. The city is currently using the Tyler Eden system. That system, we received notification from Tyler um, that it will be sunsetting in fiscal year 27. And so at this point, we have no choice. We're going to have to replace that system. That is a known cost. And so what we are recommending uh, is a set aside for each of the next four budget cycles. And, and uh, $2 million has been included in this year's budget. Um, we are projecting at this time that in fiscal year 27, that replace, the replacement of that system will be in the neighborhood of about $8 million. And so this year's budget includes $2 million and set aside for that. Uh, investing in organizational capacity to continue to implement council goals. And then there are, uh, we are currently in negotiations with five different bargaining units whose contracts are expiring um, this year. Major investments, the homelessness response. So um, obviously uh, the council has put together uh, a program in response to employee and community feedback, um, taking a very proactive approach to this. Um, we need to build capacity and, uh, and we will continue to search for systematic solutions at the state and federal level um, by our lobbyists. So the fiscal year 23 proposed budget so the total general fund expenditures are 127 million. The total general fund revenues are only 122 million. In order to achieve a balanced budget, uh, we are recommending the use of uh, $5.2 million in uh, existing fund balance. Um, and I'll get into that in just a moment. And so as you can see, when we look at the general fund reserves, that uh, use of the $5.2 million in general fund, unrestricted general fund reserves uh, in order to balance this year's budget will take our general fund unrestricted balance all the way down to zero. There is still approximately uh, $21 million in total general fund reserves that is restricted funds. Um, the OPEB reserve and the pension reserve those are locked up in trust funds. They can only be used for those specific types of activities. And then um, the council's familiar with the stabilization or reserve and the recommendation would be uh, to keep about $6.6 .6 million um, in, in that reserve. So other funds, um, we have a number of funds that are currently uh, uh, showing deficit balances in the funds. Um, including the parking fund, uh, the general fund uh, CIP, the street maintenance CIP, the stormwater overlay fund, and the equipment operations fund. And that is something that we are actively monitoring and uh, trying to find solutions for um, how to bring these funds back into, uh, into balance. Um, as the council has heard, we have some very large unfunded capital needs. 
Um, you can see the numbers here. The total unfunded uh, CIP estimates right now are about $365 million. So as part of achieving a structurally sound budget, um, we do have a balanced budget for this year, but you all have seen a number of times the long-term projections that we plug into our budget model. And in order to uh, move, continue to move towards a structurally balanced budget, we asked departments this year to have a target reduction of $2.3 million in structural cost. And departments were able to come up with proposed solutions of about $2.4 million. And over the next two days, you will hear from the departments on, on where these uh, proposed cuts are. Some of these are one-time cuts, some of them are structural cuts. And so what is Measure F? Um, measure F is a ballot measure for the City of Santa Cruz General Fund, maintaining essential services. It's a one half of 1% sales tax or about five cents on every $10. We are currently estimating that that will raise about $8 million annually. In the first year, um, the way that uh, that the CD uh, TFA collects the taxes, we would only raise about six million dollars in the first year because we would only receive nine out of the twelve months, and then in subsequent years, we would, were expecting to receive about eight million dollars annually. So the budget forecast with no measure F, and once again. When we put together these graphs, we make a number of assumptions on uh, absent of any future budget solutions, given some of the known costs, known revenues that we are expecting. Um, uh, what would what would the future look like uh, moving out several years if we were not to take any actions at all? This includes no new programs, no new staff, no expansion of programs. Um, and you can see uh, off to the left there the uh, number of assumptions that we've made as far as expenditures, continuing to put $5 million a year into that unfunded uh, CIP project list, um, about $1.6 million in new positions and uh, other items that you'll hear about in today in today and tomorrow's budget, um, $4 million in council-directed ongoing homelessness response programs, uh, the $2 million over the next four years for the ERP system, um, the one-time homelessness uh, CIP projects of $7 million. Uh, it includes an assumption of modest growth in employee costs, um, somewhat commensurate with the expected long-range rate of inflation. Um, over the course of time, we have uh, here in America, we have experienced about 2.5%, and so that uh, while inflationary costs are very high right now, we have built into the model an assumption that those those uh, inflationary factors will return to normal over the long haul. Um, the liability insurance, as I mentioned, that's going up significantly. And from what we have heard from the city's actuaries, we're expecting that to continue to rise significantly um, over the next several years. Uh, revenues and offsets, um, we did receive $14 million in California state funding, um, some ongoing fiscal reductions uh, that you can see there, as well as um, we just applied for the second tranche of ARPA funds that we are expecting to receive um, realistically any day now. Um, have it, I, to my knowledge, we have not received it yet. Um, our revenue manager is on vacation this week, but uh, when she had left, she had said we had not received it yet, but we have entered the application. So the budget forecast with Measure F looks a little better. Um, you can see the graph off to the right there. Um, the, the net total includes uh, all of those various general funds uh, items that we talked about earlier. The available uh, would be your unrestricted balances, which includes some of the ARPA money that is completely unrestricted. And that's why you see a little bit of a spike here in 22, 23, and 24. Um, but uh, we have built into the model a recessionary impact around uh, fiscal year 27. And the reason we do that is historically we've, we've experienced a recession about every seven years. And so um, to, to not build those types of things into the model would, would probably um, be false. So we build those types of things in. And as you can see, even with Measure F, we still have some structural issues that will need to be addressed um, in future years. 
So fiscal strategies, um, the ad hoc revenue and budget committee will continue its work to explore new revenue sources. Uh, we are going to be doing a citywide fee to address full cost recovery of programs. We'll continue working with our lobbyists to secure state and federal funding. And just yesterday, we released to the public a request for qualifications for assisting the city in developing a long-term financial plan, um, which includes a tremendous amount of citywide uh, uh, items that will, will be rolled into the plan that the council will see at a later date. So the public hearing schedule, um, right now we are in the fiscal summary and then tonight um, after questions uh, on the overall presentation from the council, uh, we'll turn it over to the library for uh, the, the start of departmental um, presentations and then the administrative departments, administrative services departments will follow including finance, human resources and information technology. And then we'll wrap it up with water. And then the remainder of the departments will be on tomorrow's agenda. Thank you, uh, Bobby McGee. What do those different blue colors, um, what, what do those denote that, yeah, on that chart here? Sure, that, that, that's really just to break it up so, um, so that it's visually more appealing. Um, obviously, the gray areas we, we the, the light blue areas really are the departments. The gray areas are your breaks, your lunch, public comment sessions. Okay, great, thank you. And that is the end of my presentation. Be happy to answer any questions that the council may have. For that overview, um, are there any questions from council thus far before I call on our department? Let me go to council. Okay. Um, I would like to ask the city clerk if um, we are good to continue. I know we've been having some. If, yeah, if we could take a three minute break just to reset on base. Okay. So we can get our streaming going. Okay, great. Um, so we will take a three minute uh, break to reset on base and um, return at 6.02.
City Clerk, I'll wait for your confirmation that we're ready to continue. Great, thank you. They're still working on it. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. We're good whenever you are. Wonderful, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so then thank you for everyone's patience. Thank you to Interim Finance Director Bobby McGee for that introduction. We will now continue and receive presentations from departments and provide feedback to staff for preparation of the fiscal year 2023 adopted budget. I will now call on Yolande Wilburn, Director of Libraries, to give a presentation on the library budget. And I will call for questions from council members after. Welcome Yolande. Good evening, Mayor Bruner, council members. Thank you for having me here. I'm so happy um, that I can be here to share this with you. I'm just gonna pull up my presentation here and share my screen. All right, can you see that? Yes, thank Perfect. you. Perfect, all right. So this evening, I am going to just give you a brief overview about the background of the library, talk a little bit about some of our core services, our achievements over the last year, and some of the challenges that we're facing as we move forward into our 2023 budget. The Santa Cruz Public Library System is one of two library systems in Santa Cruz County. Our system serves its region independently, although we do share revenue sources with Watsonville. The Santa Cruz Public Libraries operate under a joint powers agreement uh, among the County of Santa Cruz, the cities of Capitola, Scotts Valley, and Scotts Valley, and Santa Cruz. The original joint powers agreement was approved in 1996. And in December of 2015, all four jurisdictions approved the fourth amendment to the Joint Powers Agreement that currently governs our library services today. The library system is supported by a quarter cent sales tax, that's measure R. Um, and that tax is from the jurisdictional, and there's also uh, jurisdictional contributions known as the MOE or maintenance of effort that comes from the cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville and the county library fund, which includes Capitola and Scotts Valley. Santa Cruz Public Libraries also receives a modest income from bequests, fee revenue, donations from the public, and our friends of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. The Library Joint Exercise of Powers Agreement, which, enable, which establishes the contributions for each jurisdiction, is set to expire in, on June 30th, and a fourth amendment is expected to be approved in the next few weeks by each jurisdiction. Once that is approved, it will establish an updated maintenance of effort contribution for our libraries from those systems. 
The library's mission is to connect, inspire, and inform our community members. We do that by providing core services that support lifelong learning through our programs, services, and collections. We support digital inclusion through our training programs, um, maintaining digital devices and high-speed broadband that our communities need to fully participate in the world. Our transformative spaces in the library promote individual and collaborative multi-purpose learning zones. And our user experiences are patron-centered to reflect our, each of our community's needs. We also strive to provide organizational capacity that really works to develop our staff um, with the skills that they need so that we can pursue strategic partnerships um, in the community. The library currently um, employs approximately 102 full-time equivalent team members in a variety of administrative and public facing positions. We do anticipate that the number of staff will be increasing. We've had a number of vacancies over the last year. Um, we anticipate that that will continue to increase as we begin to reopen our libraries and expand our programming and services, as well as look at increasing some of the hours that we have at our library facilities. A few of our library achievements over the last year include maintaining open hours and services during the fluctuating pandemic safety precautions. Um, that there's, there were several challenges with staff and having our doors open, um, but we overcame those. Um, we reopened the Boulder Creek branch on May 7th of this year, and we are anticipating opening our Garfield Park Library branch on June 11th from 12 to 4 p.m. And so we certainly hope we'll see all of you there. Just last week, our youth services team received the first ever County Office of Education Partner of the Year Award, which is really exciting because of the work that we're doing with them and how we help to support the schools during the pandemic um, so that their students could have devices, hotspots, and the digital um, resources that they needed to be able to continue uh, their educations. Our staff implemented a number of state library grant programs over the last fiscal year, including programs with regard to Book to Action, the community conversation around housing with Connor Doherty and Jonathan Franzen. We increased uh, the number of Wi-Fi hotspots and Chromebooks that we have for checkout uh, because of some of the grants we received. And we're also providing California State uh, Park passes for patrons to be able to check out for free. And of course, we cannot forget our friends in the library who not only met, but surpassed their goal of raising a million dollars for our libraries. As wonderful as our achievements are, we do know that there's still work to be done and challenges. We see opportunities to complete and implement our new strategic plan in the fiscal year 2023 as well as improve our information technology infrastructure, collaborate with partners and other organizations, including the Aptos History Museum, when we reopen the Aptos Library after construction is completed in 2023. We also will review and revise our processes to improve performance and ensure fiscal responsibility. Um, we want to make sure that we are operating in a way that is most efficient and effective for our organization. We continue to face challenges around supply chain delays with regard to completing our renovations and rebuilds. Staffing shortages are currently being addressed um, as we fill positions vacated over the last two years. We are increasing uh, the trainings that we're doing and that training budget is increasing this year by 20% um, because we know that we need to help our staff grow and develop professionally. 
the costs of housing for our staff and for those who we seek to hire from outside of the community. Um, the, the cost of housing is really creating um, uh, some threats to our ability to hire and actually retain uh, highly trained staff. We do also know that we need to prepare ourselves to ensure the sustainability of our new and renovated and rebuilt libraries by supporting ongoing maintenance efforts. And so we're trying to make sure we're setting aside funding for that. The downtown library is desperately in need of replacement and the current efforts that delay and threaten the rebuild not only put us further behind on the new library, but also mean that we're losing out on some of the sunk cost to date, leaving us short on the project should we have to start all over again. And so that's a concern that we have. The library budget overview pictured here shows a 2.9% increase in staffing cost, and this is largely due to PERS and health insurance costs. The rising costs of collection, the collection insurance premiums, uh, which Bobby mentioned in uh, his presentation, have been a factor for us. Bilingual translation services, as well as the rising costs of goods and an increase in our tra training budget for staff have all contributed to the 8.3% rise in services, supplies, and other charges. Under the current MOE agreement, the city of Santa Cruz will contribute approximately $1.8 million in 2023 through the maintenance of effort. However, um, the library does pay the city for a variety of services, including human resources, risk management, city attorney, and other administrative and fleet work. And those costs, as you can see here, are deducted under the resources by fund section with the resulting net general fund cost going to the library system. Some notables with regard to our revenues, sales tax is projected to grow 4.6% in 2023, yielding an approximately $500,000 um, increase in our revenue in 2023. Um, and for the purposes of this presentation, the maintenance of effort does remain flat for us right now. However, as I mentioned previously, uh, the county and cities are renegotiating the MOE contributions made by your, each jurisdiction. And once those are finalized, um, we may see that that MOE contribution uh, begins to grow instead of remaining flat. Other notables for 2023 include a review of the number of staff needed to provide excellent service levels and reduce our reliance on on-call staff. Um, we're hoping that that will help us to stabilize our staff um, so that we can get them the training and support that they need to develop professionally, ensuring that we can retain good staff members, um, sort of a grow your own culture is what we're looking at. And then as Measure S projects wrap up and we reopen, we wanna ensure that all of our systems and infrastructure meet the health and safety needs for our staff and patrons while striving to achieve the sustainability goals uh, set out by the city. One-time costs are needed uh, to relocate our collection management and information technology teams into the library administration building and some of our fleet vehicles are in need of replacement. Our Felton Library will be established as a PG and E community resource center in the event of public safety power shutoffs. Um, and so we hope to add that type of infrastructure at our other locations so that we can be prepared to help the community be resilient in the event of other emergencies as well. We'll also continue to work with our friends of the library as, at the, as they begin their next fundraising campaign, and that is for the new downtown library branch. They have an aggressive goal to accomplish over the next three years, 
And we are really grateful for all of their dedication and support in trying to raise those funds for the downtown library. We're also incredibly grateful for the support of our Joint Powers Authority Board, our Library Advisory Commission, and the Santa Cruz City Council. And with that, I thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have for me. Thank you so much. That was uh, very informative and um, thank you for that overview. Um, also appreciated the information in the binder that we received and um, let's see, I'm going to bring it out and call for questions from council members. If there's any questions on the library presentation and budget. And I see council member Brown. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Director Wilburn, for the presentation. Yes, uh, it's it's really helpful to get a sense of where the money is coming from and uh, what the uh, the needs are. I am. I just wanted to ask about the maintenance of effort agreement and your projections on that. I mean, obviously, that's going to be renegotiated, but I'm just wondering if you think that that's going to change significantly or if you think it will be kind of within the same range um, and I, I recognize that's some speculation but I know you're closer to those conversations so just wondering if you could give us a sense of what might happen. Absolutely so right now we are anticipating that the increases in the maintenance of effort will bring us, will generate an additional million dollars a year for the library, at least in the first, in the, in 2023, typically the agreements will stagger. So each year it increases slightly more and more to keep up with inflation. And so uh, that will be really critical for us. Um, as I said, our collection insurance just, this was, went through the roof. And so, um, and then again, being able to retain good staff is important to us so that we can provide the community with the services they need. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Any other council members? I guess I'll just say thanks and welcome. Um, I know this is your first budget hearing, but uh, just want to appreciate the work that you all are doing at the library. And also, I'm imagining we're going to continue to hear a common theme of um, affordability and retention of workers being one of the number one issues um, facing the city. So just want to thank you again. And um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wilburn. Appreciate your work. Uh, I will now call on uh, the next department. I will call on Bobby McGee, Interim Director of Finance, to give a presentation on the Finance Department's budget. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome back. Thank you. All righty, this is the Finance Department Fiscal Year 2023 budget. On the agenda today, um, talk a little bit about our core services, our organizational chart. We have had a little bit of a reorganization since I've been here. Um, some achievements in fiscal year 22, um, our goals for fiscal year 23, our fiscal year 23 budget overview, and then finally some uh, impacts as part of the budget reductions that, um, that we are recommending. So our core services are accounting, accounts payable and payroll, budget, and then we're recommending to split out purchasing and have that as its own division again, and uh, revenue, and then finally risk and safety management. We currently are recommending 29 employees. Um, you can see the distribution is fairly even across the board there with the exception of purchasing. It's a pretty lean uh, purchasing division in a decentralized environment. We think that's probably an appropriate number. 
So fiscal year 2022 achievements, um, there's a couple of things that I'd really like to highlight for the council here. So one of the things that uh, the feedback I've gotten from finance staff is they have really enjoyed working with the council's budget and revenue ad hoc committee. Um, they feel like, uh, and I will say this for all of us, we feel like we're really getting an opportunity to make a positive impact on our community and, and assisting the council in, in getting the sales uh, tax measure uh, on the ballot was, um, was a real sort, source of joy for, for our staff. Um, Earlier this year, um, you may have heard that uh, Kronos experienced a, uh, a global hack event, and we had to um, pivot on a dime and establish and implement an emergency payroll processing protocol. Um, and, and I'd like to give a shout out to every department out there. People were very understanding and very helpful as we went into absolute crisis mode, trying to figure out how do we get payroll out this week, given that the entire system for all employees citywide went down. Um, it was really a, a, a citywide effort and we couldn't have done it without everyone else's help. Uh, a couple of other items on this slide that I'd like to draw attention to was since I've been here, um, I've been working with our revenue manager. Um, one of the things that we've noticed over the past several years is that the city's investments, um, primarily in LAFE, do not earn a very high percentage. And so um, one of the things that I've been working with Kim Wigley on is restructuring the allocation of some of these pooled investments. And so far, we've shifted about $30 million out out of LAFE and put that into um, government agency bonds. And the council does receive that report each month. Um, and so I think that you'll notice moving forward that um, while theoretically not taking on much additional risk, we've uh, you're going to see some additional um, interest revenue coming in over the next, uh, over the next year. And then um, we have also uh, developed a new account structure to better track resources and uses of funds related to homelessness response. Um, this is something that the finance department is extremely proud of because we've been trying to find anyone who has done this nationwide. And so far we haven't found anyone. Um, we understand that a lot of agencies have talked about doing these types of activities, but I can tell you that developing a, a, an accounting system, which is multi-jurisdictional, multi-departmental, multidisciplinary, um, to track what all of these homelessness uh, uh, services expenses and report that back to the council is a little bit bigger of a challenge than just saying, hey, start tracking that. And so uh, under the leadership of Assistant Director Marisol Gomez and our accounting team, um, they've developed a system that, that we believe is, is really kind of groundbreaking. And so we're going to um, roll that out. And some of my friends in the consulting world have reached out to us and, and, and said, how, you know, how are you going to do this? And please let us know how this looks moving forward. So um, those, are, those are some achievements that, you know, that the department is very proud of. Our goals for next year is uh, a study of citywide fees, as you heard me mention earlier, um, the long range financial plan, which uh, hit the street yesterday. So hopefully we'll get that thing started sometime in August. Uh, the consultants work will begin on that. Um, we've been in uh, developing a new cost allocation plan for citywide use. We hope to implement that in fiscal year 2023. Um, we've hired a individual to uh, focus on um, on transient occupancy tax audits of short-term vacation rentals. This is your Airbnb crowd, your VRBO crowd. Um, those have historically been uh, not, not audited at the rate that we felt was appropriate. And so now we have an individual who is focused specifically on those. Um, she's, uh, she's really hit the ground running and, and is, is, has really ramped up her activities quickly on that. Uh, we're planning on implementing phase two of creating equity and budgeting. Uh, we recently completed uh, that we and we now have a, a draft report of a procurement organizational assessment and we are going to be moving into phase two, which is a, a citywide purchasing task force 
so that we can uh, continue to strengthen our procurement activities citywide um, based on what council policies are. And we will certainly be bringing uh, some recommendations back to the council at some time, hopefully sometime this year on ways to strengthen and improve our procurement system. And then finally, uh, coming up with the new cost allocation formula for the city's self-insured li uh, liability program. And I say, and much more, because I know that there's going to be a lot of other things that come up during the year. So the finance department budget um, is about uh, $7 million in services and supplies. A lot of that is tied up in risk management activities, as well as uh, just short of $4.3 million in personnel costs. The liability fund obviously takes up the bulk of the revenue against that. And then the general fund supports the department to the tune of about $4.5 million. So budget reduction impacts, um, we are in the process of moving into a permanent location now. Um, we have been in a temporary location, uh, the Nyack building on Front Street, which is scheduled to be torn down. And so we knew that we were going to have to move. And so uh, the council approved a seven year lease over at uh, 1200 Pacific Avenue. So we are um, making final plans as we speak it, uh, to move over there. Hopefully we will be able to move into our new location in July, although it may get delayed until August. We are uh, recommending a decrease in temporary hours, which uh, is, is really kind of right sizing what the department needs are. Um, and it'll result in longer processing times for digital conversion of some paper documents that come in and uh, into the agency. However, um, we feel it's appropriate. It, it'll take a little longer to get to it, but we do believe we will still be able to get to those types of activities. Um, legal services decreasing by $5,000. Um, again, just right sizing it based on historical activities, we thought that that was an appropriate line to cut. And then finally, in courier services, uh, a decrease in cash pickup services. And so with that, I will say thank you and ask the council if there are any questions. I am available as well as uh, members of the finance staff. Thank you, Director McGee. Uh, I see Council Member Golder and then Council Member Cummings with questions. Hey, Bobby. Um, sorry for not thinking of this in advance, but it came to me while you were giving your presentation, and I've been asking this for years. I'm curious, I saw that you have an, audit, an auditor that's doing like the short term um, rentals, and I, I know people are, you know, the, the, what I know I understand what they're doing. What I don't understand is why we don't collect those TOT taxes off the top, like via the platforms, Airbnb and VRBO, like the county does. And I've never understood like why we don't do that. So I feel like our revenue would be, um, you know, higher. Uh, yeah, candidly, I was unaware that the that the county had a system where they were collecting it off the top. Um, my understanding uh, in working with our revenue manager uh, is that VRBO, Airbnb, they don't have the system capabilities in order to collect that directly and then have that um, shipped to the state. And so the way the program works currently is the hoteliers actually report it back to the city and then they, uh, they submit the funds and then we'll come back and audit their results later but they do have that capability i, I i'm happy to look into that yeah because because i i know because we rent our house out on airbnb when we're out of town and it's like as a host it's not very convenient to like submit monthly things it, especially you know nine months out of the year i'm not going anywhere but i have to submit a receipt to the city saying zero 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 and it's just kind of a pain and just knowing other friends like I guarantee people aren't being entirely honest with the city, if I can be frank. And like, I, if, um, if it was just collected and it's confusing for the guests too, they always think I'm some kind of shyster, like asking for this extra 11%. So I have to have like this receipt book and this explanation and this link to the city website. And they're like, well, this other people don't charge me. And so it's just kind of confusing. And I just think, um, if, if, if there's a way to talk to the county about the way they've been doing because they've been doing it for several years that way. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm getting text messages from my staff as we're speaking. We're happy okay. to look into that and see how, <laughs> how the county is doing that. Uh, 
the information that that we've been given. I've been on the phone for some of these conversations, so I'm not sure exactly how they're doing it, but I'm happy to look into that and and see if there's a better way. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Golder. Councilmember Cumming. Yeah, thanks for that presentation. I actually had a question. Um, it's related to the presentation, but it's also for the city manager. I'm just wondering, um, I know you were able to show where those, you know, certain cuts and reductions are gonna need to occur. And I was just curious for the city manager, if we have that information for all the, the, the departments, and if so, if we can get that, because I think it really helps, because um, the budget packet that we have doesn't include that information. And it'll really help as we're thinking about where cuts are being made and if we want to you know shift the where those cuts occur it'll help to have those numbers and be able to see um you know where the cuts are occur are happening yeah thanks for the thanks for the question councilmember cummings as we move through the department presentations that information will certainly be included as we move through um so happy to continue providing those details as we move through department by department of where those um reductions have been made and as Bobby mentioned earlier, it's about split 50-50 between one-time reductions and ongoing reductions. So it's a combination, uh, including some um, some unfilled positions. And we're happy to provide those details as we move through. Thanks, but um, I guess my, my bigger question is wondering, is there a way we can get that in writing? Because like, if that was with our packets, we could see, if we could kind of follow it line by line. And, and um, yeah, it would be, just be helpful if we had physical copies of that information as well. We can certainly provide a summary for the council to review. Does that conclude your questions? Thank you. Uh, council member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, council member Brown. Glasses. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, so I, just as a follow up, I, I, it would be to Council Member Cummings. It, that would be really helpful. I, in the past, during budget hearings um, and prior to adopting the budget, we have had those summary summarized for us by department. So we just have a kind of like a cheat sheet to help us um, uh, understand by department what's um, where the cuts are. Uh, and so it, that would be great if we could get that just via, I don't know, in a memo or something that we can have for reference. Thanks. Okay. Are there any other council member comments or questions? Okay, thank you so much. Um, to your work and to your department. Thank you. Let's see, I will now call on Ken Morgan, Director of Information Technology, to give a presentation on the IT budget. Sure, I think HR was scheduled to go first, but I'm happy to jump in and jump out of order. Um, sure. Thank you. No problem. Uh, sharing my screen, can you see my presentation? Yes, thank you. Great. So uh, good evening, Mayor Brunner, City Council. My name is Ken Morgan, uh, Director of the City's Information Technology Department, and here to give you an overview of our proposed budget for the upcoming fiscal year. <clears throat> uh, presentation, like other departments, will include an overview of our core services, a uh, highlight of some of our key accomplishments this past year, uh, I'll cover our fiscal year 23 proposed budget and finally discuss goals associated with our upcoming fiscal year. Uh, starting off with our organizational chart, uh, these folks make up the city's IT department. When fully staffed, uh, the department has 21 full-time equipment employees with three of those individuals being funded and assigned to the public works and water department. Uh, at this time last year, I reported out that the IT department was operating at about 65% capacity and while we're still working towards reaching full capacity, we have made progress, including uh, filling some key leadership vacancies. Uh, Mike Schmidt joined the team eight months ago as our assistant director. Uh, Dennis Kiabo has been promoted to IT manager in charge of our infrastructure. And we've also added some talented folks to supplement mm -hmm. our process and application solutions teams. And that would be 
James Armstrong, our new business systems analyst too, and Eric Koimoku, our new programmer analyst. And just as yesterday, we added Blake Irby, our new business systems analyst for the water <laughs> department. <clears throat> Our IT uh, mission remains the same, which is to cultivate increased connectivity of people, technology and processes. And we do this by trying to deliver business-driven, efficient quality technology solutions and services for our staff and the public. And these efforts really do start with our amazing client services team. These are the folks responsible for receiving and resolving thousands of annual requests via phone calls, uh, work orders at the city's help desk. And they really do an amazing job of supporting the hardware and software on the city's endpoint infrastructure. That's our PCs, our laptops, our mobile devices, our desk phones, and all together, that's an ecosystem of about 2,000 devices. Our infrastructure uh, services team manages network and infrastructure and data centers and offices throughout the city. Uh, it includes our wired and wireless networks, our server infrastructure, our voice over IP telephonic equipment, uh, and they spend a lot of time on security, and that's both cybersecurity to keep the bad guys out and our physical access security to protect our city assets. Uh, our process and application solutions team, uh, we support over 90 applications citywide. These are our database admins, our developers, our custom report writers, uh, project managers, and application experts. And then last, we have our strategic and admin services division focused on strategy, uh, special projects, and uh, <clears throat> of course, budget planning and execution. Uh, with regards to our accomplishments, uh, always best to start by highlighting our customer service. Uh, despite staffing challenges and COVID challenges and shifts in how our colleagues are doing business, uh, the level of customer service continues to be something our department is proud of. Uh, and that uh, equates to directly serving 554 of our employees. That, that means 70% of city staff sought out IT for technology support of some type. Uh, we replaced 127 PCs. Uh, as part of the ongoing emergency telecommute policy, we supported 230 uh, employees that worked remotely in some capacity. We answered or responded to 2,800 help desk phone calls, and we completed 6,300 work orders, which was an uptick of about 5% uh, over the previous years. <clears throat> uh, with regards to infrastructure, uh, this is often a less recognized aspect of service delivery, uh, which is why I wanted to highlight a few impressive statistics our critical network infrastructure and our critical server infrastructure were available 99.9% .9 of the time last year. And I know Bobby mentioned the Kronos outage and that is a hosted application, not one that we manage internally here. So uh, uh, good to delineate that. Um, IT geeks refer to 99.9% uh, .9 as the uh, triple nines. And really that just means that services like email, uh, network files, applications, uh, they were available for all but eight hours accumulatively last year, <clears throat> pretty impressive. Cybersecurity continues to be a focus for us. Uh, from an infrastructure perspective, we took a very proactive step forward and we partnered this year with a managed security, security service provider. Uh, the service provides both intrusion prevention and detection devices in our network, uh, as well as an actual security engineer that monitors our endpoints within our network 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So uh, a really important step forward in improving our posture, uh, along with <clears throat> security awareness uh, our security awareness training uh, <clears throat> continues to be prioritized. We provide quarterly security awareness campaigns for employees. Uh, and this year, we also introduced phishing tests in which we anonymously sent out suspicious emails asking employees to take actions that would be considered risky mm -hmm. or, or counterintuitive to best practices. And the hope is that the training employees have taken pays dividends. Uh, but if not, the uh, tests give us some insight as to where training would be focused in, in the future. And then applications, while we were onboarding an almost entirely new team to the application space, uh, there were some notable accomplishments. Supporting 90 plus applications, we upgraded uh, our Tyler ERP system, our cashiering system, uh, our utility management system. Uh, we added additional transaction types to our aggregated payment portal, My City of Santa Cruz. The community can now pay for planning permits online. Uh, and last, we're in the final phase of two RFPs to select a couple of enterprise applications uh, it's going to bring us a new and modern land, land management system uh, and also a new computerized maintenance management system for our public works and water department. <clears throat> Getting us to our budget overview slide, uh, IT's proposed budget is 5.9 million, uh, 3.4 goes to personnel services. Uh, the remaining 2.5 is going to be our service supplies, uh, other and capital outlay. 
Uh, the major costs for IT continue to be the, the software and hardware maintenance contract, as well as our telecommunication services. These three categories make up about 81% of our non-personnel related costs. IT's proposed budget does represent an increase of 4.5%, uh, and this is the result of a few factors. First, we have our anticipated inflation for our maintenance and support contracts. Uh, this is typically about 1% to 3%, uh, depending on the contract. Uh, in addition to those kind of uncontrolled expenses, we have committed uh, ourselves to a couple of other priorities. Uh, one is our Microsoft 365 implementation, which is currently underway. Uh, that is going to modernize our employees' ability to work and collaborate. And then the other investment priority is our cybersecurity enhancements, which uh, I highlighted when I discussed our managed security service provider. From a personnel perspective, we are also requesting two additional FTEs to help support our applications team. Uh, one position will be funded and assigned by the water department. Uh, and the second position is an IT business systems analyst three position. So uh, outside of the water department, we currently have one IT BSA that is responsible for supporting those 90 applications and business systems. And so adding this position is uh, gonna add a senior level BSA to supplement those support <clears throat> challenges. And in addition, Bobby had mentioned the uh, sunsetting of our ERP. And so this person will kind of lead the process to replace Eden, which is gonna be a multi-year, multi-department effort. <clears throat> so we are proposing close to $180,000 in cuts to help offset some of these increases. Uh, cuts would include eliminating and consolidating some IT tools and departmental apps. Uh, additionally, we have worked with AT&T to find some cost savings in the types of uh, telephonic equipment that's used in our city-owned elevators. And then the larger impacts are going to come from a reduction in our capital outlay fund, as well as reducing the number of PCs replaced next year. Uh, reducing capital outlay will prolong the replacement of some of our networking and server infrastructure, and then reducing the number of PCs replaced uh, for a second consecutive year is going to likely lead to more increased help desk work orders to kind of support that, that aging infrastructure. <clears throat> I'm running up against my 10 minutes, but I got some goals for the next fiscal year for the department. Uh, I mentioned the two RFPs that we are uh, very close to wrapping up and we'll move into project implementation mode. Uh, the Microsoft 365 project, project that I mentioned, uh, we're hoping to finish that in the summer and fall. Uh, we have some plans to improve the technology and the security used to support our remote workers. Uh, we've been pursuing an ongoing physical access security project. We have over 30 sites completed now, and we're focused on the downtown facilities, including City Hall, Parks and Rec, Civic, uh, and ED. Uh, like other departments, there's some supply chain challenges, so we're remaining patient there. Uh, we have uh, an ongoing approach to our cybersecurity mitigation. Uh, we'll be required to perform an, an audit this year of our credit card handling. The city uh, executes about 2 million transactions per year. So we're, uh, we fall under a PCI card uh, uh, audit that's required. Um, we're going to be working with the city manager's office and a third party vendor on an initial phase to improve, improve our ADA compliance on our website. <clears throat> and last, uh, as I mentioned, the city's ERP is set to sunset in 2027, and this will be a multi-year, uh, multi-department project uh, that we'll need to focus on. And that brings me to the end. Wow. Okay. You did it. <laughs> Thank you so much for that presentation um, with that additional information from our binder our budget binder. Um, can I ask a quick question of, of the uh, analyst one, two position you said was funded by the water department? So we have two position ads. One is a programmer analyst one, two. That one will be funded by the department, the water department and supplement the business systems analyst three that exists over there. So two allocated positions to water. And then the general fund request is for a business systems analyst three for the remainder of the city. Okay, got it. Okay. And um, one more question under business apps or where does CRISP fall on, in, in your IT world? Yep, so CRISP falls under our uh, process and application solutions team. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, we had just onboarded uh, a new assistant director, Mike Schmidt, 
And one of his first asks is to do a deep dive into CRISP and uh, kind of articulate out the business process and make sure that departments uh, are working in a kind of con congruency that we have subject matter experts assigned so those work orders are getting completed. Uh, I understand a lot of the general service requests that were coming through were sometimes uh, perhaps falling through the cracks. So that'll be a part of this to, to make sure that we have a, a, a more cohesive approach to that. Great, thank you. Um, and CRISP is, um, for those that don't know, CRSP is the acronym for the city's community request for service portal. And um, there's a free app as well as a website URL to report to any of those categories to the city. I think there's eight categories. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Ken. I, I wasn't able to catch, um, did you say 800,000 in reductions? $180,000 in reductions, but we had an overall increase based off the obligations that I discussed, like Microsoft 365 and the uh, cybersecurity. Okay, and, and so, so it was a 4.5% 4, 4 increase to that 180. So 4.5% equates to about $265,000, which is the overall increase for the department's budget. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other council member comments or questions for IT Director Ken Morgan? On the Just like a you know a brief comment in that, and you don't there doesn't necessarily need to be an answer, but you know we get a lot of information about smart cities and how cities internationally are using technology just to improve quality of life and resilience to climate change, and so I look to those world of tech to help us know what we could be doing or innovation that we could embrace, particularly in our proximity to Silicon Valley and all of the innovative um, folks we have in our community, um, just to think about what, you know, what we might not be thinking about. So I know that you already have some of these goals set out and I just, I feel like there's also so much more. So anyways, I appreciate the work and I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Okay. Thank you, that concludes. Thank you. Thank you for jumping and being ready to go. No problem. I will um, now call on Lisa Murphy, Director of Human Resources to give a presentation on the HR budget. Thank you, good evening, Mayor, good evening, Council Members. Lisa Murphy, your Human Resources Director, presenting my final budget. Um, let me put my... PowerPoint up here and share my screen. Let's see, share screen. Okay. Am I sharing my screen? Can you see that? No. Oh, oh. Why am I? Let's see. Let me try that again. I, I have it up if you if you need me to. Oh, I think um, I'm getting there. There we go. Share. There we go. Yeah, let me get it on to the um Inning. There we go. Great. Well, thank you. I'm pleased to present the FY uh, 2023 budget for my department. Human Resources mission, I'd like to share with you as a resource and a trusted advisor, we strive to cultivate an inspiring and fulfilling work environment that attracts and engages a talented workforce. Some of our notable achievements for this year, COVID-19 response. That's really a lot of what we focused on. We've been creating new policies, bringing on employee testing uh, locations. We are one of the first agencies to do that, uh, to returning our workers back to work safely. Uh, we've initiated a diversity, equity, inclusion program here in HR. Uh, that's one of our biggest uh, undertakings this year where we've worked on revising job descriptions to eliminate biasness. We revised our minimum standards to recognize not everybody needs a college education to achieve, uh, to enter the workforce. We've implemented implicit bias training for all of our hiring panels. And we've also implemented a new employee bias training program. We've moved to online applications and in, in our 2023 uh, goals, we wanna move on to uh, 
technology with the support of IT, my partner in crime, uh, to, to do onboarding online. We've also completed a, a lengthy compensation study, and we've also just about to wrap up our permanent remote work policy, which I'm excited to get that implemented. And along with a number of other um, notable number of recruitments, uh, implementation of benefits, these are just a, a, a top level look at some of our notable achievements. Just a quick summary of our budget. Overall, our budget is $25.5 million. But what you'll see, that is primarily composed of workers' compensation and benefits. So there's five categories within there. We have administration, so workers' compensation, benefits, unemployment, and our volunteer program. When we do all of this, we administer our program to over 800 employees, nearly four to 500 temporary employees during given the season with just 11 employees. Our services include recruitment, selection, onboarding, labor relations, administering our workers' compensation program, our benefits management, training and organizational development, and we also staff the Equal Employment Opportunity Committee. What's changed in our budget? What you're actually going to see is a pretty large increase in our budget, and that's due to our workers' compensation budget. Our unemployment insurance increased from an average of 90000 to over 278000 a lot of that had to do with um, the COVID. Lisa? That was huge. Yes. I'm so sorry. This is Bonnie. Um, the issue we were having with Zoom earlier in office just happened. So the people who are listening who are at City Hall probably missed a lot of what you just said. So if you can go back maybe four slides or so. I'm so sorry. No worries. Where, where do you think? Right, right there. Right, right there. there. I love technology. I, I, okay. Um, do you think we're we're back online there? Uh, I am. <laughs> I can see you, Mayor Bruna. <laughs> where where I last heard. <laughs> I think Thank you, Lisa Murphy. Um, all right, I'll, I'll I'll go over once again because I don't want to shortchange my staff and and I want to be able to recognize that they I have this incredible staff and the achievements that they made. Again, just a review for those who may have missed this uh, section of my presentation. I think COVID response was, again, one of our number one priorities, our return to work, bringing back our employees safely, implementing policies, implementing the sick leave, uh, implementing employee testing on site. Also, I want to really highlight our, our initiation, initiated our diversity, equity, and inclusion in human resources department. And some of those things that the actions that we took, we have revised our job descriptions taking out any bias type language. We revised our minimum standards for employment, really looking at whether you need a college education or, or is, is experience uh, just as a, an equivalent. We have implemented implicit bias training for all of our hiring managers and our hiring panels. We have, again, new employee bias training for, for our new employees, a bias training program. And some technologies, we've moved to online application, and we're looking to move to online onboarding, which would be a huge technological achievement. And we completed a compensation study. And finally, one of our, our biggest lifts is to complete our remote work policy for our employees. A high level summary of our budget, it's 25.5 million to the general fund. There's five budget categories that we break that into, and I'll go into more detail in a couple of slides. We have administration, workers' compensation, benefits, unemployment, and we also house the volunteer program. And we administer all of these programs to over 800 employees. Uh, we have over between four and 500 temporary employees, depending on the season. Uh, we do that with a staff of 11 really hardworking, dedicated human resources program um, employees. No. Did we freeze? I have a feeling we're frozen. No, we're not frozen. We're good, okay. Uh, let me just go over a few human resources uh, services. Recruitment, selection, onboarding, labor relations, workers' compensation, benefits management, training and organizational development. And we also staff the Equal Employment Opportunity Committee. Now into our budget numbers, some notable changes. Well, my budget actually, we 
we were uh, tasked with um, eliminating two and a half percent of our budget, which was an equivalent for the general fund was um, about $50,000. We also had some pretty large increases and those notable changes increased my total budget almost 10%. And those were as a result of our workers' compensation increased over $2 million. And that is a reflection of an updated actuarial, which we do every three years and it catches up and it looks back to what we've experienced and then we carry that forward and it raised our, our workers' compensation rates. Uh, we had some notable injuries uh, the previous three years. Uh, our unemployment insurance increased from an average of 90,000 in 2020 to nearly 300,000 in these past couple of years. And that was most notably due to COVID. And in addition, medical insurance has increased nearly a million dollars from the previous year. Just to look at the numbers overall, you can see from FY19 to FY23, we're fairly consistent, but then we have this jump that's coming up again, you see from 2022 to 2023, it's the cost of doing business, quite frankly, unemployment insurance, medical benefits and workers' compensation for over the past three, uh, again, the, the previous three years. Just a little more detail on my budget, where that money goes. You can see in the different categories, administration, that's what houses my staff for the most part. Um, then we also have our medical insurance, which you can see quite frank, the yellow is 20 million. Um, our unemployment insurance, roughly around 300,000. Our volunteer program is roughly 50,000. And then our workers' compensation uh, program, which is the gray, which you can see has a steady increase where it went from 3.3 last year to 5.06 million. I quickly want to give a little more detail of some of the things that we do because it's pretty incredible what my staff does. Our training and development program is pretty, pretty robust. We offer nearly 65 um, classes to our employees. In our recruitment, we looked at, we reviewed 2,500 applications. We are an employer of choice. We do have lots of people who want to come work for our city. We also rank their classification and compensation plans. We we administer our labor relations, which is all of our employee negotiations. We have eight bargaining units. And as you know, we're in, in negotiations now and all of our employee relations. And that's where we work with our employees, uh, re resolving conflicts, um, working to help improve relations and also our, um, some of our fun programs like employee engagement. Which I wanna give a little bit shout out again to my play training development. This is one area where I really refuse to, to um, shave off the budget or nibble at the edges because this is one area that's so important to uh, professional development. It contributes to succession planning. And if we start to eliminate here, we're, I think we'll find ourselves into trouble. Um, one of the things that training and development really, again, encourages our employees to move up through the, through the ranks. We do a lot of promotion, internal promotions. Uh, this last year, we had 585 employees attend our voluntary training programs. So we have voluntary training programs. We also have mandatory training programs, such as cultural awareness and sexual harassment and discrimination. We have a really great leadership development academy where employees can advance in their career if they do not have, uh, one of the credits to doing our leadership academy is that if you uh, take eight classes, you will receive one year of supervisory experience. And that really helps those folks who never have that opportunity to supervise, to start to move up through to be supervisors or into management. And again, over 65 classes that are voluntary for our employees to take. Uh, and, that, and we're starting to see a pickup. Since COVID was tough trying to do it online, my staff really worked hard to get folks to attend. Uh, but now we're starting to do a little more in person. We're going to kick off our fourth and, uh, employee engagement survey. So that's pretty exciting news. It, it took a little hiatus because of COVID. But we want to get back in there and get back to our work plan. In addition, it's really important for succession planning. And we have a really robust program that, again, I think COVID has really you know, impacted how we've been able to reach out to our, our folks. But we're about to relaunch our programs, such as our stretch assignments, our career counseling, our job shadowing programs, and really getting our folks, because that's what we want to do, is get our folks ready for that next step to move up to. Uh, our employee labor relations, again, I want to give a, a bit of a shout out there. We have over eight units uh, that we work with. We have work really hard to resolve workplace issues. This, this division also 
works with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And this, this division also works on the diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility program that we're trying to launch. Benefits team, this, this really small team, when you think about how many employees that they are trying to manage their benefits and all the programs, medical, disability, retirement, insurance, vision, dental, long-term disability. It's incredible the amount of knowledge that these people in the, in the benefits division have and work with our employees, particularly in some of their most trying times. Uh, they, they are there to help them through some of these really difficult decisions and help them with their benefits. Uh, workers' compensation, we did see a 34% rise in our, our costs. Again, what happens is, is it's a look back uh, we have an actuarial done every three years, and they look to see what our experience factors are. Uh, again, we did have some pretty large um, claims. We had some cancer. We had some very large medical claims uh, that have uh, that are called presumptive in our public safety sector. Um, and then those will stay on our books for about, again, another three years till we can cycle those off. Just wrapping up, uh, just to give a shout out to our volunteer center. Uh, they're a fabulous group. We house them in the HR department. Our city contracts with the volunteer center. We supported over 300 volunteers and our total volunteer hours last year was, fiscal year was over 8,000 hours. And that's actually kind of on the low and that's a lot of hours, again, because of COVID, but I think we're gonna see a nice big uptick. And finally, my uh, HR priorities are not very different from the previous year. I wanna stay consistent with what the things we're working on. Number one, employee development, for, uh, professional and personal development. Number two, succession planning, stretch assignments, the overhire program we implemented, the coaching and the mentoring. You can't get enough of the succession planning. And three, improving our organizational culture through our employee engagement program and our diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility program. The HR, we serve the people who serve the community. So I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, respond. Thank you for that presentation, Director Murphy. Um, thank you for the goals as well. And um, I, I, can you give a little timeline on the diversity, equity, inclusion launch? Sure, we're actually already in it. We've been implementing for the past year where we take our, uh, we've been taking our, our um, job descriptions. So as a new job opens up, we've been taking them one at a time. We already implemented the, the hiring panel training uh, in January, February, where we wanted to really, before I even launched a, a documented program, which I'm still working on the actual document with the work plan, I wanted to get that out there and start training our employees. Uh, and we already implemented what's called Circle Up has been the, the company we brought on to do the, the training for us for the uh, cultural um, training. We started that actually about a year and a half ago. So we're, we're so slowly implementing the different aspects of it. And then the, my, my final version of the copy will go to the EEOC to really uh, solidify the plan and you know, get it in writing. Is Circle Up the company out of Oakland? Yeah, I think that's okay. where they're from. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Council Member Golder. Thank you, Lisa. I took one of those classes online that you were offering. I like, I don't know, maybe a year ago or something like that. It was, it was good. It was, it was, it was interesting. So thank you for doing that. Um, I did have a question with two questions actually. One is in regards to uh, the workers' compensation. Was you said it was? Do you, was some of the increased cost due to COVID? Is that what I heard you say? You know, actually, I had thought that that's what we were seeing was yeah. because what happened in, for public safety, the law changed and that COVID was a presumptive injury that it happened at work. And so that was a minor piece of it, but we actually haven't quite seen that impact yet. But it really, unfortunately, we had, like I said, some uh, in, in public safety, some um, medical conditions that were um, life threatening. And without revealing too much, that really picked, uh, our, jumped our claims up quite a bit. I'm sorry to hear that. I hope those people are, you know, doing well. I did have a question, a follow up to that question was, um, it, you, um, the department where my husband works over the hill, they're required to be vaccinated. Are our public safety 
employees required to be vaccinated as well? No, our employees are not required to be vaccinated. And so if they get COVID at work or if they, then we still have to pay them? It doesn't matter if they're vaccinated or not vaccinated. We actually have a really high vaccination rate in our city. It was close to nearly 80%. And actually yeah. in the fire department, it was almost 100%. But even we're still getting COVID. No, yeah, uh, I, I understand yeah. that. I just was curious. Because, yeah. yeah. But, but uh, the way that works is, is you're, you're right. It's presumptive. So it automatically is assumed that they got it at work. And so immediately they get 100% of their salary from day one until they return to work. Okay. And then a completely unrelated question about the work from home policy. While I think it's great for people to be able to, you know, to do that. I'm con slightly concerned uh, because as the city, we are, you know, a public service um, organization. And I'm concerned just about a decline in our ability to serve our customers in, in departments where, um, you know, not everybody has access to technology. And, and I know it can be frustrating, like, for example, like going to pick up a building permit or going to the water department or going... Um, from place to place. And if people aren't available because they're working from home, it can be quite frustrating. And I've heard a number of complaints um, over the last couple of years about when's the workforce coming back. And so if that's not happening, I have a concern about um, the, the service, that level of service that we're providing as an organization. I agree. I agree with your assessment. We, at the end of the day, we are a public service that's what we do. We we service the people, right? And so have, being open and being accessible is extremely important because you were right. There are inequities in our accessibility on technology. And I think each, everybody needs to recognize that and make adjustments for that. Um, the policy is operational based on each department. They can choose how they want to implement uh, the, based on their, their level of customer service. So for example, um, I'm open all the time and I do have an individual who is in the front office. And so that person is not able to telecommute because I, we have such a uh, customer interaction where some are. So it's really dependent on, I think the job and the ability to telecommute and, and the, the ability to monitor and to make sure that we aren't, um, there aren't a reduction in service levels. I, I, I agree. And we put in, in terms of um, the, in the policy, the, an agreement and the ability to monitor, at least for, uh, performance wise, but that the customer facing and the office opening may be a different, a different issue. And I'd be happy to you know, work on that or address that. Yeah, I just think it's hard then when we're treating all employees essentially equally in bargaining negotiations, but some are here physically every day, day in, day out, and some are allowed to, you know, to, to not, and it, it's, it's hard to wrap my head around that as well. Thank you. Does that conclude your questions, Council Member Golder? Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do any other council members have any comments or questions for the HR budget? Okay. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. And um, I believe now I will call on Rosemary Menard, water director to give a presentation on the water department's budget. Welcome, Rosemary. Good evening. Um, there we go. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, the opportunity to talk about the water department's budget. And I'm going to, um, I'm gonna tag team this presentation a little bit with our chief financial officer, David Baum. Um, we're going to talk tonight about our core services and alignment with the Reenvision Santa Cruz Council um, priorities. We're going to talk a little bit about our org chart. We're going to talk about key accomplishments. And then I'm going to give a quick overview of the operating budget and the capital uh, investment program. 
And then as you may, some of you will probably recall, we do an integrated thing where we have a financial pro forma that's part of our long range financial plan that allows us to integrate the way we look at our capital and operating budgets into a kind of a one financial picture that helps us really look at how we're doing and how we're meeting the goals that uh, the council established for us when they adopted our long range financial plan, uh, which we updated in 2021. And then finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Water Commission's engagement with us on um, our budget and CIP development and review. So what our core services are, you know, we produce and deliver safe, high quality water to 100,000 people. We do it 24 seven, 365. We provide uh, meter reading and billing and prompting uh, courteous customer service to our customers. The meters are, we have 27,000 meters in the system. They're read monthly, bills are produced and delivered monthly. Um, our, our customer service staff processes about 45,000 uh, customer calls a year. And uh, we do utility billing for the city, for the wastewater and also the refuse. So uh, we take refuse calls and also um, the anything related to wastewater. Um, we operate, maintain, and when we're needed, repair, replace water system infrastructure about, valued at about a billion dollars. And we plan for and manage 4,000 4, acres of land and many valuable natural resources and for long-term uh, sustainability in our community. Um, the the re-envision Santa Cruz priorities, which got carried over into your new work plan for this coming year uh, has, had three priorities and we're, our work is very aligned with two of those financial sustainability and also infrastructure investment. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about those things as we get through there. Um, we, are going, we are an organization of about 120 FTEs and you'll see uh, that we're divided up into these four big operating organizations. I wanted to mention a couple of things related to uh, the, the IT budget because a number of you probably heard of things related to IT that uh, were specifically uh, focused on water department things, whether it was the computerized maintenance management system, for example, or the business systems analyst three, or the programmer analyst position that is um, that's gonna be added in the IT budget this coming year, and that the water department is funding. Part of the reason that we're doing those kinds of uh, funding across our organization is that we have applications and needs based on our, our billing system is one. The, uh, the metering infrastructure that's being replaced now provides a lot of additional opportunity for technology uh, innovations and also for customer portals to support that. The uh, computerized maintenance management system that we're talking about uh, that you heard about a little bit earlier, that's a basically a work order system that our customer service folks would use to take work orders that they receive from calls from customers, send that information out to our staff to follow up, whether it's a water quality complaint or a leak um, complaint, that work order system will be the portal to you know, connect those or, uh, organization and send that out and produce a document that comes back into the system to make sure that we've finished the work. But also when it comes back in to finish the work um, order, it will update the asset information about that particular asset, whether it's a meter or a pipe or you know, a, a, a something that's going on like a pump station. And that information is really invaluable in planning and uh, de and developing a capital investment program because you have really sophisticated and uh, and on you know organized and online kind of uh, information about the quality and condition of your assets. What helps what helps you really have an effective and sustainable over time um, asset management program for the billion dollars in assets we manage. Um, I think that. One of the, uh, another thing I just wanted to mention as we're sort of talking about this uh, customer service or the, the chart here, the um, enterprise resource uh, planning program, the ERP replacement that Bobby talked about and that Ken talked about, 
Uh, this is something that the, what the utility billing system is currently a part of our Eden system. So the replacement of that uh, ERP process, which is planned out a few years, will also have a major impact on um, our utility billing system, which uh, supports obviously, uh, you know, producing really tens of millions of dollars in revenues for our for our community for the uh, enterprise resources. Um, so in terms of accomplishments, I think that in addition to making water and making it come out under every kind of imagining condition, whether it's you know COVID or um, other kinds of challenges, we, uh, we did complete a lot of really important projects over the last uh, couple of years involving updating the urban water management plan and water search contingency plan. Uh, as I mentioned, the updating the long range financial plan and updating our system development fees and water rate charges, rates and charges. Those are major elements of our financial foundation and our utility planning foundation that we've completed in the last fiscal year and parts of this fiscal year. And then we initiated construction on a system wide meter replacement program. Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant Concrete Tanks Replacement Project and continued construction on a really uh, big project that's going on at Newell Creek Dam right now. And it's about uh, six to nine months away from being completed, a $103 million uh, project that's getting ready to be completed. And we're gonna, I'm gonna show you some pictures of that in a little bit. Um, our key performance measures that we monitor, obviously, and we you know, are really careful to see how we're doing is uh, we have 100% compliance with drinking water quality standards, uh, zero worker comp uh, injuries requiring more than a 30 day absence. Um, we have 98% of um, folks paying with their, or 94 in uh, fiscal 22, goal of 98 in fiscal 23 of people paying their water bills within 60 days. So even in spite of the, um, of the COVID and some of the economic issues associated with that, our customers continue to pay their bills. Uh, we also implemented a water arrearage program and we're in the process of implementing a wastewater arrearage program that's funded by the state and also a additional water uh, low income uh, water rate assistance program coming out of state funding. And in the governor's May revise, he um, offer, authorized an additional 200 million to go into that fund. So we have some progress on um, helping our, our low income and fixed income customers who may be struggling with rising utility bills to uh, provide some support there. That's something we've been actively working on. And then we maintained our credit ratings with the Standard and Poor and Fitch. Um, the overview of the operating budget, we're at 39.3 million. Uh, you can see here that uh, we are looking at some significant, um, you know, personnel costs are a big chunk of it. Uh, clearly uh, services and supplies, chemicals, power, um, other kinds of services and supplies are a big chunk of it. Uh, debt service is becoming a bigger portion of our total um, budget over time. And you'll see some information about that. And then we have a capital outlay that pays for um, capital equipment, the trucks and um, you know, other kind of machinery that we use in our operation that's not part of our capital improvement program. Um, we, we're looking at personnel costs, including no salary increases in, this, in the way that this budget has been put together because across the board um, that, you know, we're still in the process of negotiating with uh, the, the labor um, group. So we don't have an assumption of building into for salary increases. We, we are looking at benefit increases of about eight and a half percent and services and, and supplies uh, increases of about 6.9% from fiscal 22. Part of that is definitely the cost of inflation. And then three additional positions um, that I mentioned, an additional engineering tech, uh, the replacement of a limited term management analyst with a management analyst for our um, customer service uh, group, and then uh, the additional uh, programmer analysts that we are funding out of the um, IT's budget. 
And then this is just some comparison of a number of years of our operating budgets, uh, the actuals versus the adjusted budgets um, from that came in. And I want to point out a couple of things going on here in 20, uh, fiscal 2020 and fiscal 21. Uh, fiscal 2020 was the beginning of the impacts of the COVID uh, shutdown. And so I think that the spending that we anticipated doing in that period really got scaled back due to the shelter in place activities that started happening there. Um, and then in fiscal 21, we had uh, the impact of a, um, a furlough, a 10% furlough for employees that wasn't built, that was not built into the original budget, but was shown up in the actual spending. One of the things we've been working on over the last several years is to try to align our actual spending a lot more closely with the the budgeted amount and our staff have been working really hard on that. So in proposed, we're showing about um, 40 million, close to 40 million. And again, uh, the same categories that you saw on the previous slide. Moving on to the capital budget, um, for the next five years, our capital improvement budget is 295 million, which is $2 million uh, more than last year. However, we have significant unspent funds that are carrying over from fiscal 22 to fiscal 23. A lot of that has to do with some of the slowdowns associated with some supply change things. And you know things have taken a little longer to move forward than um, we imagined. Um, we do, in terms of forecasting our capital costs, we've been looking at construction costs, which have been uh, increasing. And we're looking at a eight and a half percent increase in construction costs over last year. It's a significant issue. We're being actively monitoring it. Supply chain issues are a big uh, part of that uh, disruption and contributing to the inflation of our um, of the cost of construction that is being experienced not just by the water department, but really all across any the city and the community and the county and the, the country, really. Um, this is an example of our uh, what looks like our five year and the way that our capital budgets will be over the next five years. As mentioned, there's a pretty good size for year one, there's a pretty good size carryover. So this amount really is larger, but this is the amount of additional appropriations we're asking for in fiscal 23. Um, the, we're funding these by a mix of state and federal loans, low interest loans and bonds uh, proceeds when needed, as well as pay as you go financing. And you'll see some results that compare those amounts a little bit further on in this presentation. Um, this is the, the sort of new appropriations and where those dollars are going. The uh, Graham Hill Tanks project uh, is really, um, it's underway right now. It's under construction right now. Uh, we have a um, new creek pipeline replacement project that is coming and that will be a big chunk of funding in uh, fiscal 23. Uh, the finalizing of the Newell Creek Inlet Outlet Replacement Project is occurring. Uh, we're working on water supply, aqua storage and recovery and recycled water projects uh, that are moving forward to try to uh, help us with our drought vulnerability. Meter replacement is on this list. Uh, doing a lot of planning and design under the design build contract we have for the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant Facilities Improvement Project. Uh, we've got a um, Brackney landslide area uh, pipeline risk reduction. That's a part of the Newell Creek pipeline replacement project that's uh, upstream of the Belton to Graham Hill piece. Uh, main replacements and water, water program administration. These are funds that we use to sort of fund the sort of overarching support services for the, uh, the Santa Cruz water program. And at the end of the year, these funds are allocated to the projects that got worked on. So they're not they're not just sort of like funds that are spent for things that are uh, don't matter. They're, they are allocated out to support the actual cap capital programs that will be happening. Um, I wanna sort of take you through some slideshows. This is a, a picture of Graham Hill water treatment plant from the air. The tanks that are being replaced are these three tanks right down here. The plant is a subject, the, the facilities improvement plan is working on basically a major upgrade of this 1960 era facility. And um, you will see uh, here is the uh, tank construction. This is a few, few months ago or a few weeks ago when they were, oops, 
sorry, uh, when they were um, removing the the original the one the tank one of three, and they're getting ready. They are actually building the replacement tank for tank one right here, and getting ready to uh, build tank two, which will then allow them to take tank two out and build tank three, and then they'll. Uh, Finally, the end process will get rid of the last tank. So this is a big project that's underway and um, we'd be really looking forward to an opportunity to take you up to see this construction and project uh, in, in process. It's, it's a pretty fascinating project, big and uh, consequential for this facility. But the facility has to operate without these tanks, which is a little bit of a challenge. And so that's one of the reasons for the phasing why it happened. Um, here's a familiar picture of the um, of the Newell Creek Dam and Loch Lomond Reservoir. This has also been the subject of a lot of work over the last couple of years. Uh, this is the actual work in the reservoir to replace the, the intake structures, build new, new intakes. This is a part of an a intake structure. As you can see, the scale of this particular thing that uh, with this person here working on it, this is a set around the uh, the actual intakes to be able to protect them. This is the uh, part of the 1500 foot long tunnel that uh, goes around the dam to connect the new piping to the new intakes. And this shows you sort of all the way down into the tunnel. This tunnel's completed now and they're getting ready to install the actual pipelines. The intake structures are completed in the reservoir as well. And by the miracle of, um, I think uh, GIS, they were able to actually connect this tunnel to this intake structure under the reservoir and they hit the mark on the nose. So that was really great. Another thing that we're doing and just to sort of wrap up this part and then I'm gonna turn it over to David. This is the Laguna um, diversion, which has a uh, 1890 uh, plaque on it. This is a really one of the oldest structures in the obviously in the water system. It was part of an original privately owned water utility that was acquired by the city in the, the 1916 when they were pulling the various pieces of, wa of water infrastructure in the community together to create a water system. And the one problem with this particular facility is that we've, uh, it traps a lot of sediment and it's a very difficult to operate once that sediment has been trapped. So a new facility, this is called a Coanda screen has been added here that allows for the sediment to move through the system as opposed to accumulate behind and still allows us to divert water when water is available through a new intake structure here on this dam. So this project was under construction last year and was completed um, at that time. So I think with that, I'm turning this over to David. And um, David, if you want to come on and um, take over this to, for the remaining part of it, I think I can change the slides for you. Okay, great, thank you. And um, I'll just move quickly through this because this is sort of a reiteration of what Rosemary has already provided in terms of the operating and capital budget for the, for the water department. But the purpose of my uh, little spiel here is just to talk about how we incorporate this into our pro forma model. And we're guided by the long range financial plan, which the council approved um, last September, uh, as well as um, we, we did a cost of service study last year and uh, created new rates. And, and, and that was something the council approved as well. So that's all now being put into our long range financial plan and, and model and the um, the outcome that we look for is, is the what is the debt service coverage what are the cash reserves because we sort of make a implied promise to the marketplace that loans money to us um, and you know we're held accountable by the rating agencies Stern and Poor's and Fitch to meet these and so we're very cognizant of these um, these coverages and these reserves and so this model will just I'll show you is, meets those meets those targets. Next slide, please. So uh, as Rosemary mentioned, the key assumptions are these um, salary benefit increases, um, eight and a half percent, and then the service and supplies. Uh, you know we we're fall we're we're coming into a period of great inflation, and hopefully it's transitory. But so far it's been a little bit sticky. And so this is unfortunately what we're dealing with. I mean, one of the things that I think 
uh, maybe Lisa mentioned earlier in her presentation is just how the pension costs have increased. And, you know, we're looking at an 18% increase for the unfunded liability um, created by the Cal in the CalPERS system. And so that's, that's, that really pushes on the salaries and benefits and services and supplies. Rosemary mentioned uh, the power of the electricity. We're a huge electricity user over a million dollars a year. Um, that's going up by greater than 10%. Um, chemicals, uh, the kind of chemicals that we use to process um, through the water, those are going up significantly as well over 10%. Um, but maybe the biggest change are the interest rates. Um, we've enjoyed historically low interest rates, um, um, getting an SRF loan for $149 million to build a couple of those projects. Uh, we're now seeking more SRF uh, state revolving fund money um, for the next couple of projects. And we're also seeking um, a loan from the EPA for Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act money, which is also below market. It's below what we would um, have to pay if we were to go out for um, municipal revenue bonds, which in today's market, they've risen to 4%. Just to put that into context, last year, they were at 2.5%. So that's why there's this asterisk at the bottom subject to change because interest rates, if anybody's been refinancing a house or looking to buy a house recently, you know how they've gone up dramatically in the last six months. Next slide, please. Um, just to look back to last um, September, November, we got these increases for the water rates that we need to build um, what we think is about a $600 million capital investment plan over the next uh, 10 to 15 years, we were focused on the, the next five years in the CIP at that, and that's the 295 million. But these are the kind of rates that need to be increased 6.9% up to 16.4% to get those projects done. And then if we look beyond that to um, the work that goes past the five years, I mean, we focused on five years because the CIP is five years, but we're looking at probably 10% for your rate increases thereafter. Next slide, please. Uh, the pro forma that we have, um, again, factors in the revenues, the operating costs, um, but also the capital investment plan, the 295 million, how do we pay for that? And um, as Rosemary mentioned, there's 113 million in the current year, fiscal year 22, not all of that's gonna be spent um, we, we bet burrito lunches over this. Um, we're told by our consultant that we're going to probably spend 69 million and carry over 44 million. Some of us think it's more like something around 50 and 50, but um, su suffice it to say, there's going to be a fair, fair amount of carryover of the capital improvement pro investment program into fiscal year 23. And then, um, of course, again, through the pro forma, we see that our metrics are met. Next slide, please. And here's a, an abridged uh, version of the pro forma um, showing the revenues, the expenses. I mean, we break it out in much greater detail on our, on our computers, but for presentation's sake, this gets to show you what the net operating revenues are forecast to be um, in the current year and then the next five years and what the debt service also is forecasted to be. Um, so the focus we have is on that debt service coverage um, in the middle of the page. And the, the legal requirement for the water department's debt is that we have a dollar 20 of net operating revenue to each dollar of debt service. But according to our long range financial plan, it's a it's dollar 50 to the dollar. But here you can see that we are higher than that. So we feel like we have a pretty good plan for meeting our debt service. And then looking down the page to the cash balances, um, we focus on the, at the bottom there, fund 711 and fund 716, 90 days of cash available in each or 180 days available in each to pay for operating expenses in the current year. So if, uh, like Rosemary mentioned, it's, um, you know, 100, uh, it's a uh, 40 million plus a 40, we're looking close to 20 million um, for um, the 90 day cash. 
And then, okay, so at the, at the bottom line of our <clears throat> model is the 180 days cash that is the target that we meet for the next five years. Next slide, please. So just, just some graphical presentation of what that looks like. Um, fiscal year 23, we have very little, the red is cash funded versus the debt funded um, because we've had a couple of lean years in terms of revenue due to COVID and drought. Um, we expect with the rate increases that we're gonna do better in the cash funding in the years to come um, after fiscal year 23. Overall, over the next five years, we're looking at 85% uh, funded with our loans and 15% funded by cash. And that's aligns with the long range financial plan um, that we was approved. Next slide, please. Uh, the operating forecast, um, I guess one of the main takeaways that on this one is that while it isn't increases by the amount of 6.9% per year, the biggest piece of it is the debt service, um, which goes from about 5 million in fiscal year 23 to around 13.5 million in the last fiscal year. So that's about 165% increase in the debt service. And that's the main driver for the operating expense um, forecast over the next five years. Next slide, please. And then finally, the cash balances by fund, um, the cash balances increases mirror the increases in the operating uh, expenses. And they are an invaluable resource for us because, you know, for the last couple of years, I mentioned that it's been lean and the rate stabilization fund 713 has been used to restore some lost uh, money to the fund 711 and 713 to make sure we, we hit our targets um, over the last couple of years. So we expect that to um, improve over time. I just want to mention there's certain talk uh, recently of a recession um, that could come next year. And um, if you look at the history of water revenues in the water department, there was one bad year in particular in fiscal year 2010, where it dropped 10.7%. And that, um, if that happened today, we would be dropping about 4 million, four to $5 million. Well, because of these reserves, we could weather that kind of a situation, not saying that's gonna happen and don't wanna create a prophecy that would create a situation of negativity, but we're, we're pretty well positioned for you know changes in the economy if they should occur. Um, so now I'll turn it back to Rosemary for the final slide. Great, thank you, David. So just to give the council a little bit of a context, we work very uh, closely with our water commission starting usually around the beginning of every year to talk to them about what's going on with the CIP and uh, both the projects that have been completed and the projects that are planned. In March, we uh, provide them with uh, you know data that, for example, in this year that was uh, linked to water quality data is linked to the Graham Hill uh, Waste the Water Treatment Plant Facilities Improvement Plan, which is a really important project and a big chunk of the funding that is going to the the capital uh, investment work that's going to get done in this five-year window. And then in May, we present the sort of first look at the budget and CIP together, including the kind of budget analytics that you've seen here, the information about where we're going to be with our pro financial pro forma and uh, meeting our targets. And then in June, in a couple of weeks here, we'll have a final meeting with them where they will actually take an action on providing their recommendation to the council on um, a, on our budget and CIP for the fiscal 23. And that will be reflected in the materials that you see in your budget um, approval packet that comes to you for the June 14th meeting. And with that, I'm going to take your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rosemary Menard, for that presentation, and David Baum for explaining some of the trends and past financial overview. Um, it's really interesting to see uh, 
the scope of work that has been done and um, that still needs to be done. And I always, you know, see the water department as this invisible <laughs> need to, to most of us in the community, um, but extremely vital, right? Yeah. Um, thank you for all of the work um, and getting us uh, financially stable in our reserves, um, which is incredibly important for this department. Um, I'm going to bring it out to council members for questions, comments on this uh, water budget presentation. Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation, um, Rosemary and David. Always impressed by your work, and I always really appreciate how you brief us on a lot of the big issues that are impacting our community and our city and our decision making. I just, I, I guess my question is more around kind of at the state level, we're seeing, you know, more awareness, more concern, I think beyond what I feel like I've had kind of the average um, person or average kind of news source really report on. And I'm wondering if you had any kind of, if you could see into the future, you know, if you can predict what the state might potentially um, impose upon communities and how that could impact our forecast for the city of Santa Cruz. It's okay if you can, but. <laughs> just... Yeah, um, well, that's a very timely question because the State Water Resources Control Board met today and uh, to, to look at um, emergency conservation restrictions. And we have been working with the, the State Board staff and also with Senator Laird's office. Uh, once the, re the proposal came out one day last week to talk about the potential impacts of those restrictions that seem to imply we would have to Im impose um, our stage two of our water shortage contingency plan, which is rationing and enforcement. And um, we actually worked with them and today they adopted a alternate compliance strategy that was sort of tuned to our reality. Maybe a few others will fall into the into that group, but had to do with um, water utilities, uh, the, the, the characteristics of these water utilities that will have an opportunity to sort of have modified requirements have to do with the um, a really low gallons per capita per day for residential use, which is ours is really low, um, a uh, not being part of using any resources from the state water project or the Colorado River and having a relatively limited amount of resource from an overdrafted groundwater basin and then um, basically uh, being able to demonstrate that their water supply was adequate for this year and through fiscal next year, um, or the count, uh, water year next year. So this is water year 23 coming up, uh, starting in uh, October. And we had to dem have to be able to demonstrate that we have an adequate supply to get us through uh, this year and next year. And I'm, I'm confident that we can do that. I mean, obviously I did that when I was looking at supply recommendations to you um, in April and talking to the water commission about that at the time. So um, I think that with respect to, uh, there, there is a huge concern at the state about the level of um, water availability from you know some of the big state reservoirs. And uh, I think that the, the you know, for those of you who might have been around in 2017 when I had did my budget presentation for 2018, and when a big part of my presentation was called "The Chickens Come Home to Roost." I think I remember that slide. <laughs> yeah, well, the chickens on climate change and water supply in California and the West are coming home to roost here, right? So, mm -hmm. a lot of the information that was um, in some of the the uh, survey results, the polling results that I shared with you, uh, uh, I think last time, you know, does indicate that people are getting the climate change uh, implications on our community and water supply being, you know, a pretty obvious uh, sort of um, canary in the coal mine for what we might be seeing. I think for us, the, the really important thing is, and the thing we're working on this year is really about getting additional supply available in our community so that 
our customers can continue their very conservative <laughs> behavior, but still have a assurances that there will be water in the event we have really long multi-year, you know, back to back to back dry years. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, I appreciate your work and your advocacy and your just communication with our state representatives and, you know, recognition of our unique situation here in Santa Cruz as well. So thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Any other uh, questions or comments from council members? Council member Brown. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, Rosemary and David, for the presentation. I, I don't really have any particular questions. I just want to acknowledge the incredible work that you all do to manage a really complex and, as we all know, aging system. And you know, it's, it is really overwhelming to think about all of the work that you know coordinating all of that work how much work needs to be done um and i just uh i just think that we are in such capable hands i feel like there is stability um even in the midst of all of the kind of unknowns that we're uh looking at and um and i'm i was so thrilled to see i love these presentations um more for the progress reports and and you know learning about and, and seeing what's happening on the ground and in the field um and I'm just thinking about um, the one of the visits that we took to, um, you know, look at that, you know, the, the need for the tunnel <laughs> underneath the, the reservoir there, and then the um, the other work that needed to be done uh, at the river. And it's just amazing to see the progress that's been made um, on a project that I couldn't even wrap my mind around when, um, you know, stat water department staff were talking about it with me. Right. So I um, uh, just wanted to really thank you for, for everything. And it's, it's, Great to get the updates and um, see the sound financial footing that you are keeping us on. Thank you so much. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the really fabulous work of 120 people who work at the water department, you know, whether they answer the phones or they design projects and work with uh, in construction or they take care of leaks that are happening or, you know, talking to billing meter reading meters um you know supporting the administration of the department and the financial management we have a great team and i'm really proud of the work they've done i think that there were times i think in the last couple of years when the uh, level and the complexity of some of these projects is was really intimidating and could have paralyzed the group and i think that through a lot of sort of fortitude and um, perseverance they really have gotten through it. And I think they actually are beginning to believe that they can do this kind of complicated stuff and the water will still come out. So we have a great team and I'm really proud of them. Okay, thank you, Council Member Brown. It looks like that concludes um, questions from Council for uh, Water Department budget. Thank you so much, David Baum and Rosemary Menard. Um, and that does conclude our departments for today, the presentations. Uh, let's see, in, in, at this time, I will bring it out to public comment. If you are interested in commenting on fiscal year 2023 proposed budget, Raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature in the webinar controls on your computer. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to three minutes. In addition to the public comment, we will be hearing on this item, two emails were sent to city council at cityofsantacruz.com. Okay, going out to our attendees. Our first member of the public for public comment. And if there's a specific department, please state so or a specific question or comment. Our first phone number ends in 1999. Hi there, welcome. 
Um, good evening. Can I be heard clearly? Yes. Hi there. Okay. Hi. My name is James Ewing Whitman, and that was very interesting. I listened to the whole thing. Took five pages of notes. Um, okay. I'm really glad that the time was spent on the water. Water is really rather important. I was had a very close friend in 1999 who worked for Citizens Utilities in Felton when a brand new water treatment plant was being built, and dozens were being built just like it all over the United States. But this one had a lot of problems. So fortunately, that plant got fixed, and hopefully the dozens of others being built at the same time were. There's an incredible amount of money being spent on water, as it should be. Um, I'm going to maybe give some insight to what Vice Mayor Watkins had said. Um, seeing about water into the future, there was an AMBAG meeting on January 15th, and I'm pretty sure Justin Cummins was also on the call, and there was a subject that came up about the state and federal agencies aren't really talking to each other and they're not really listening to each city's independent needs. So I'm glad that I hope that it seems like the situation's in pretty good hands. That was really nice to listen to. Another comment I have, I think it was Gelder made a comment, something about people work from home and slightly concerned as we are public servants that we are not physically available face to face. Obviously, if that were possible, I'd be talking to you guys in person. So otherwise, this was actually fascinating. Um, and I'm going to enjoy the five pages of notes and let's see what other people have to say. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public is the name I am watching you. Yes, hello. Have you ever heard and understand the phrase, the bigger the government, the smaller the citizen? I'm thinking you haven't. I've already voted no on Measure F because I don't believe in continuous government expansion relative to my personal economy, and I don't see a demonstrated willingness to engage in sound fiscal policy that prepares for the looming next recession or worse. In the spirit of non-sustainability, I would point out that according to the census 2010 to 2020, the population growth of the city of Santa Cruz was 5% in those 10 years, and otherwise I read somewhere six and a half over the last 12 years. According to your own budget analysis in the last seven years alone, we will have seen an increase in full-time employees of 8.9%. I expect for sure more city employee count growth occurred than that over the equal 10 or 12 year period to be easily double the population growth trend. I'm no accountant, but using simple addition and looking over the actual revenues and expenses from 2015 to 2021, you have fairly consistently overestimated both projected incoming revenues and very consistently overestimated actual expenses in budgets. And that perhaps from department heads sandbagging, easily seen using actual final adopted budgets and actual final revenue expense data revealed by the following year. I get the city actually came out of minus 34 million, give or take over that seven year period with some wild fluctuations. I assume the general reserve fund took a beating, but I didn't find that balance sheet anywhere presented except maybe for today's manager presentation. I interpret his comments to mean the balance is planned on being blown next year. So it's more the same spending exceeding revenue in 2023. Meanwhile, over the last 10 years, due to unsustainably astronomic inflation and fee increases, property taxes are up 78%, sales and use tax up 200%, uh, transit occupancy tax up 240%, the windfall of which is apparently nowhere near enough for you as you propose piling taxes on those even higher. Somewhere in your minds, you might consider that that tax party trend won't go on forever. When the party's over, it's over, over, no do over. Just an idea, how about either proactively shaving your revenue estimates a bit lower since they're regularly too high, or assign a priority budgeting of any actual surplus to replenish the general reserve fund if, when, and until reserve funds are solidly built, if depleted below target to adequately handle the inevitable possible vast recession and boom bust when conditions don't allow tapping of that fund. Better budget estimates on this proactive policy change could prove to the public by hard fiscal controls that you can actually handle basic finances before permanently asking them for more tax monies to fund your dreamy government expansion spending plans even further. 
The governor's emergency declaration is currently a farce. That's not a good excuse for your uncontrollable overspending habit. I ask, is there any limit to how much you would like to squeeze from the public? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I'm looking to attendees. If you would like, this is the public comment period uh, for the agenda item, fiscal year 2023 proposed budget. You can raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. And it looks like that does conclude public comment. I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Okay, we have, um, we will continue our budget uh, presentations with the rest of the city departments tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. and anticipated to go until about 5 p.m. tomorrow. So given that, we've asked our questions and at this time, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful Thank evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night.